The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning, Mr Gray. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, might I make some brief opening points uh, just for the to mark the start of the day? It, it's a very simple summary of the day's business today. We have one witness. The concluding witness of this hearing is Ms Elizabeth Cosson, AM, CSC, Major General, retired. Ms Cosson is already in the witness box in answer to her summons. I'll call her in just a moment. Before I do so, I'll just make some brief comments uh, setting the context for Ms Cosson's evidence. Ms Cosson is the Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. That is the government agency that has frontline responsibilities most directly concerned with the support of veterans. The functions, operations, purposes and resourcing of DVA are central issues in this inquiry. There are urgent issues, Commissioners, that you are focused on in the lead up to the requirement for you to prepare an interim report of this Royal Commission. And those urgent issues include matters such as the claims processing issues that are affecting uh, DVA at the moment. And you most recently heard some evidence about those in the second hearing block, hearing block two in Sydney. Uh, I will be asking Ms Cosson further questions about claims processing and interrelated issues concerning staffing and funding of DVA. In addition, there are some other issues that I will be asking Ms Cosson about, and I'll be focusing on those issues that it's open to conclude might be regarded as urgent issues. But commissioners, this is just the first time that you'll be hearing from Ms Cosson in my submission. It's overwhelmingly likely that you will need to call Ms Cosson back uh, on at least a later occasion and probably later occasions, plural, to inquire into other detailed topics and to elicit more evidence from Ms Cosson about the DVA on those matters. So in a way, this is an introductory session and it shouldn't be regarded as the final word by any means. And much of what I'll be asking Ms Cosson about is really to give Ms Cosson an opportunity to explain what the DVA is doing on important issues of relevance to your terms of reference. I call Ms Cosson, she's already in the box and I ask that she be administered the oath or affirmation now. Liz Cosson. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Cosson. And just for the record, your um, name is Elizabeth Cosson, isn't it? That's correct. Thank you. And Ms. Cosson, you've prepared a statement in response to a notice to give statement received from this Royal Commission. I did. I'll just ask that, that be displayed, just the first page of it, because it's quite a lengthy statement. Mm -hmm. And then I'll ask you to uh, consider whether you can adopt it uh, to the best of your knowledge and belief. Do you have available to you on the screen a document with a document ID in the top right corner, DVA 9999-0008-0001? Yes. Yes. And do you recognise that as the first page of the statement you've prepared in response to the Royal Commission's notice to give statement? Yes. And the statement, including its annexes titled ECO 1 um, right through to ECO 8, uh, comprise 58 pages. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. To the best of your knowledge and belief, are the contents of the statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Commissioners, I'm going to tender Ms Costin's statement in just a moment. I'll ask first, though, that uh, 
the operator display attender list in respect of Miss Cosson's evidence, as you'll be um, used to by now, Commissioners, there are a number of documents in that tender list that are just included for convenience because they've already been tendered and they have exhibit numbers and I won't itemise each of those, but if, if you have the first page available, Commissioners, you'll see that items six and seven have already been tendered and have exhibit numbers and there are a number of others throughout the document which uh, also already have exhibit numbers. But with the exception of those documents, um, I wish to tender all the documents in the list, the first item of which is Miss Cosson's statement. The document contains blue shading in respect of certain documents that indicate that the Commonwealth is making um, a confidentiality claim in relation to those documents. If we could ask uh, operator, if you could please go to just item twenty-one on page does three. That, um, the document I'm looking at, I had that there was a claim over document four. Did that not? I don't have that. Um, um, I'm instructed that the Commonwealth made a claim in relation to document four. If that could be tendered on the mm. usual basis until we sort that out. Yes, I won't display document four. It has made it as a blue mark document in the hard copy that we've received, so it's in the system yeah. somewhere. But well, there must be two. Pleased. There must be two versions. Do yeah. apologise. Um, I, I don't seem to have that copy. Now, um, I won't publicly display item four, commissioners. Uh, if we go to item twenty one on page three, uh, it's entitled ESO Roundtable Agenda. Uh, it says it's subject to a confidentiality claim. Um, it appears, pardon me, Commissioners. Do you have? Yeah, I've got one here. Can you get me a proper half copy of that? I think we're looking at different documents yeah, again. I know. Yeah, I've just, I've just realised that, Mr. Ford. That's right. So if we look at item 22, that's um, entitled an ESO roundtable agenda. Uh, the pages to which I'm intending to take Miss Cosson of that document, I don't believe uh, are subject to a confidentiality claim. And I'll just ask my friend to indicate now, lest we be derailed when we get to that. I'm going to go to pages 1893 through to 189, big pardon, 1899. And if he could take instructions as to whether there's any objection to my publicly displaying those pages, I'd be grateful. I'll do that while my friend continues. Thank you. Pardon me for just a moment, Commissioners. I'm just trying to sort out that issue. Pardon me, Commissioners. Now, um, So subject to my taking care when we come to those documents that are shaded blue, and uh, we may need to have direction if I'm to display any of the other documents that are shaded blue in the list, I seek to tender the documents in the list. Okay, subject to those provisions and be accepted as exhibits and allocated the next lot of consecutive numbers. Thank you. Ms. Cosson, I'll just uh, start with a topic that you address towards the end of your statement, 
in paragraphs 201 to 209, which is the important topic of the DVA's monitoring of the risks of suicide and suicide prevention strategies. Because of course that's a key issue that ties what the DVA does to the terms of reference of this inquiry. What are the DVA's current activities monitoring the veteran population for risks of suicide? So may I refer to my statement, Mr Gray, or you just want um, me to it, talk more broadly about what we're doing in the department? Well, for... if, if you need to refer to your statement, you can to okay. refresh your memory, but if you know off the top of your head, what are the DVA's mm -hmm. current activities monitoring the veteran population for okay. risks of suicide? It, so if I can start just talking about what we have been doing in recent years um, where we commissioned the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare to help us understand what was um, the nature of suicide in our veteran community because we were hearing that there were um, increasing incidents of suicide. So from that, um, when AIHW started delivering reports, we looked at what the risks were um, that they identified in their monitoring. And each year we've had a report from the Institute and what those emerging issues were. So there's quite a few things that um, we have been doing in well, that regard. Well, I just asked you, what are you doing to monitor the risks? So to monitor the risks, yes. um, what we do is we um, maintain a regular uh, list of, which sounds dreadful to be honest, Mr Gray, we're, we're conscious of uh, the fact that those by suicide are, are veterans and also the impact that has on their families. So we've been looking at that to understand what we can be doing to improve, to make sure that uh, we've got in place as many measures as possible to reduce the, the risks around suicide. Um, so... I asked you about what are you doing to monitor the risks of suicide in the veteran community and you pointed to the commissioning of AIHW to produce the reports that it's produced and updated and there's now been four of those on a four key reports on an annual basis, correct? That's correct. Now, I don't think you've identified anything else in your answer that DVA does to monitor the risks of suicide in the veteran community. You, you're alluding to things that you might do as a result of the AIHW's monitoring, but you haven't pointed to anything else that the DVA does, correct? So knowing the risks from those reports has been important for us to um, monitor what the risks are uh, for suicide, to put in place mitigation um, to reduce that risk. Y yes, but my question is, mm -hmm. what is the DVA doing to monitor the risks? And you said that on the basis of those AHW reports, you do certain other things to mitigate, mm -hmm. but you haven't pointed to anything else that DVA does to monitor the risks. Is that right? So we do monitor the risks and we monitor the incidence of suicide in the community. So monitoring the risks can include um, men, young men we know are high risk between 18 and 24 and working very closely with defence, particularly those that have less than 12 months service to put in place better transition um, and then to, if they are presenting with risk, to, to do wraparound support to them. I see. So um, you do have measures in relation to people transitioning, Correct. in particular young men you've mentioned. Correct. And you try to, what, form an assessment as to whether they're at risk on an individual basis, do you? That's correct. And what's the mechanism by which DVA does that? So Defence will advise us if someone is transitioning for medical reasons or administrative reasons and we will have a look to um, work very closely to ensure that any of their um, conditions, um, illnesses or injuries that have occurred during their service that we can progress their claims uh, before they leave. So that is really important to then give them some uh, assurance that they're going to get support when they transition. And have you evaluated whether that function is picking up all of the people who um, are at risk. Do, um, do, do you know a formal whether... evaluation? No, yeah, but we right. are looking to see um, uh, to ensure that we are picking up as many as we, we can. We we don't know all. No. All right. Um, anything else that you're doing to monitor the risks of suicide in the veteran community, as opposed to commission, commissioning AIHW to monitor those? Yes, those so, suicides um, that are occurring. 
Sorry. Um, so, yes, we have through um, a range of mechanisms such as our open arms, our um, veterans and counselling service, uh, open arms will certainly be uh, very alive to um, um, veterans or families who do present where there's potential risk and making sure that if it's something that we need to be doing to uh, progress a claim, that we're doing that. Similarly, we have new mechanisms in the department uh, through my office as well, where people can alert us to um, potential risk of suicide. And we we manage, well, we put in place wraparound support and escalation for those individuals. Um, we also have a, a team of triage and connect um, and case coordination. So we've got a range of, of mechanisms in the department that where someone is brought to our attention that they are at risk, that we wrap around those uh, services to support them. Well, the wraparound services and the triage, again, I'm, I'm asking about the monitoring as opposed to the, the, the things done as a result of monitoring. They sound to me like they're more like steps that take place if monitoring results in the identification of somebody who may be at risk. That's correct. It, yeah, okay. Um, the open arms uh, channel of communication, um, who does open arms speak with if an open arms counsellor forms, forms a view of the kind you just described that there's a need for? Uh, particular support to be given by other areas of DVA? So Open Arms sits within our Mental Health and Wellbeing Services Division and the, within that division there's also the triage and debt and uh, case coordination. So there's an escalation process that Open Arms will follow if um, a veteran presents at risk. Thank you. And that triage, uh, connect and escalation process, how many people are allocated to working on that? I'd, I'd, I can in, get you that number, but I don't in, have that. In full-time equivalent? Yes. I don't have right. that number with me, but do I you can know certainly get it. Do you know approximately? No, I don't. Okay. I know in the division it's um, – I've got the number for the division, if that's helpful. No, um, no, I'm just no? asking for okay. how many people are working on that function. No, I'll have to yeah, I'll get back to you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Now um, – in your statement, in referring to this topic, um, and I'll just ask the operator to bring up paragraph 208 and 209, page 40, you are asked what priority do these matters have in DVA's plans and budgets? And you answered that the well-being of veterans and families, including mental health and suicide prevention, remains a key priority for DVA and its planning. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to spend uh, a little more time later today on looking at um, DVA's purposes and functions in more detail. And we'll look at the statutory outcomes that DVA is required to meet and report on. They don't include um, in, in effect, the enhancement of mental health and mental wellbeing, do they? No. And they don't refer to suicide prevention either? No. Nevertheless, um, you say that it remains a key priority for DVA and its planning. Is that as a matter of your administrative discretion? That's correct. And at 209, you say any resourcing through budgets is a matter for government in the context of its other competing priorities? And it's suggestive the way you've referred to that um, straight after saying that uh, mental health and suicide prevention remains a key priority for DVA and its planning. Um, are you saying that there are resourcing limitations preventing you from doing everything you would wish to do on mental health support and suicide prevention? Yes, I am. And what sort of impact are those resource limitations having? Are you um, not currently satisfied with the level of attention that DVA can give to suicide risk monitoring and prevention? 
That's a very big question. And I am I always believe there is more that we can be doing. And as part of the, the broader Commonwealth and as the Secretary, I'm responsible for uh, putting um, to, to budget and um, at my IFO each year, budget proposals. And uh, as part of a broader Commonwealth, um, we put those forward and... Um, Are you able to give our Royal Commissioners an indication of the sort of magnitude of increase that you think is needed to uh, to fund DVA's uh, suicide risk monitoring and prevention activities? No, I don't have a figure. Are you able to estimate an order of magnitude? Is it is it that the funding available for that at present is is only about what ten percent, twenty percent of of what you would like it to be? It's more there are a whole lot of activities that could be done to reduce that um, wouldn't necessarily specifically go to mental health suicide prevention, but it's a very broad question um, of what I would like to do is very, um, it's across the department, across all areas of the, of the business. Are you able to just itemise maybe the top one or two of those activities? Um, greater information sharing with defence, um, and we're doing a lot of that, uh, where we've got um, um, plans in place and um, activities so that it is automatic sharing and we can access the information from defence. We've been very focused on early intervention um, and early engagement with members from the point of enlistment. And I believe through that early engagement that goes a long way for uh, reducing uh, risk and then, of course, the, the complexity of our system, which I know the commissioners have heard a lot about. Um, there, there are a range of ideas around reducing complexity, um, and that could be through harmonisation of legislation or reducing the complexity around our administration. All of those activities could go to reducing uh, risks of suicide. And then, of course, with the uh, census last year, where we asked Australians, have you served in the Australian Defence Force? That will help us build greater data and insight, which could go a long way to uh, reduce the, the risks. So there's a lot of initiatives and opportunities, but I cannot give you a number. And you don't feel that you're resourced to address any of those four activities that you've mentioned currently? Partially resourced for all of those activities, but not fully, no. And, and what sort of increase do you need? to, I to don't perform have those activities. I don't be, have a figure on that. Um, a, a, an order of magnitude or a, or a proportional increase? Do you have any idea? No. Ha, have you not costed uh, how you believe those activities should be performed? We have done uh, indicative costings um, internally to the department to understand if I can use an example of harmonisation of legislation that could be a significant cost, but that is really just indicative and it would depend on which direction we wanted to take um, our legislation so and that hasn't been decided. So you've done indicative costing on at least some or one mm. option for harmonisation of legislation but not the other projects? That's correct. Okay. You, you mentioned in the May 2021 budget there was funding to establish a targeted adverse analysis capability. That's a paragraph 203. I'll ask the operator to bring that up. May 2021 was about the time this Royal Commission was announced. Is that right? I'm just trying to recall. I thought the Royal Commission was announced after that. I, I, it was, sorry. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned this measure. Do, do you believe this will be a useful capability to have when it comes to uh, enhancing DVA's efforts to understand suicide risk and prevent suicide amongst the veteran community and suicidal ideation and suicidal risks and behaviour? It is one factor that will um, support us do that, yes. 
when was the idea for the targeted adverse events analysis capability first generated within government to the best of your knowledge? Uh, within government, I don't know, I can't answer that. Where did the idea come from? Um, I, I think the uh, adverse events analysis is well known across the medical community, but when was it thought of in, in DVA? I could probably suggest that was back in uh, 2019 where we started to have a look um, after we were getting the AHW reports and we gained a better understanding of what adverse events analysis actually mean and how they could be used to um, inform the work we're doing. Um, wasn't the first AHW report in 2018? That's correct. Um, so it took about a year before DVA thought of the adoption from the medical area or medical sector of this capability in the DVA context. That's correct. And then it took, what, another year or two before this was adopted as a budget measure. Is That's that right? Correct. Why so long? We're always learning about what is happening out in the broader community and how that can apply um, into the, the department. And um, a normal process would be to consider how we could apply that developing uh, proposals to go forward. And, and we, we did receive funding in the budget to undertake adverse events analysis. I don't think you've answered my question with respect, Ms Cosson. Why did, it, why did that take so long to first for DVA to um, come up with the idea that that capability would be useful uh, and then for that to be approved by government. Do you, do you, are you able to tell our Royal Commissioners why, it took why so long? that took those years for those events to occur? It was just part of our normal consideration and, um, and regrettably things do take some time to, to get worked up into policy proposals and go forward. What progress has been made on it? So at this stage, um, the, the team that are working on the adverse events analysis are, are building up an understanding of how far we can take adverse events. We have not, at this stage, um, undertaken any adverse events analysis on suicides. Right. And just to step back for a moment, is your understanding of what this capability might be able to be, might be able to deliver, is in effect a, a warning system for what system-wide risks or individualised risks? How would it work? It's more through the lens of DBA type risks, so having a look at um, what it is showing that we need to do to um, correct our system if there are systems issues. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't operate as a system that would raise a red flag if I could use that issue for a particular individual because of an event in that individual's life? No, we don't propose looking at the life events of an individual. Um, we're purely looking at it through the lens of DBA. I see. And you say in paragraph 203, you won't adopt a comprehensive root cause analysis approach since you, you say we, will not hold all relevant information regarding the veteran's life circumstances, nor will we have the necessary expertise to do so. I just want to ask, it's the case, is it, that the capability, at least uh, to the extent that you understand its, it, its, its shape and its form, will be limited to information that's available on DVA systems about veterans who are current client or have been current clients of DVA, is that right? That's correct. So it won't give you insight into the broader veteran pop population who haven't approached DVA for benefits or services from DVA, is that right? That's correct. And as, as you say in, I think it's ECHO 6, you estimate there are 632,000 veterans in the community. Correct? That's correct. But looking at just veteran clients and not family clients, but just veteran clients. There are 183,665 veteran clients as at the time you prepared your statement. Do you recall that? 
you can just, just I've just read something in in ECO three. I might need to, I need, I might need uh, to big correct one, that. ECO eight. Your um attachment to your statement. Sure, that's uh that's a page fifty five, please, operator. Oh, yes, that's um that's an old that uh, placemat has pardon, been page fifty eight. Big pardon, page fifty eight of your statement. Is that an old number? Sorry, I just so that is the attachment to yes. my statement, and yes. that was taken from our um, mental health and wellbeing strategy and national action plan. So that was a placemat that is um, no longer an as at. So I at see. the moment, we would have um, uh, approximately two hundred and sixty thousand veterans that we support. So we are seeing the numbers of veterans increase uh, that we do know, but you are still correct that we don't know everyone that is served. Okay. And are there any plans to try to have a broader capability to understand risks through data analytics of uh, suicidality and, and wellbeing impacts that might lead to suicidality in the veteran? community more broadly through a capability such as this adverse events um, capability? So Is there any other project of that kind so that might it, have a broader database? Yeah, in addition to the adverse events, certainly the work that we're doing on data and analytics and longitudinal data to understand um, the, the life journey of a veteran from enlistment um, and then through life. And uh, what's the name of that project? We call it DSAS, DSAS. Um, and um, it's it's very um, um, closely connected with defence and sharing the data with defence. And when you referred a little earlier to activities that you'd like to be better resourced, they're partially resourced but not, mm. not as resourced as you would like, mm. was the DSAS project the project you had in mind when you referred to data sharing with defence? DSAS is one component of the data sharing. We also, and I'm sorry I'm going to use acronyms, um, uh, DDEIE is the other one that we're doing um, in early engagement. But there's uh, Defence is looking at a Defence electronic health record system, which I think um, we would uh, want to, to be resourced to do some further work with Defence on that. Thank you. Um, now, you, you've spoken about some of the other measures that might be described as suicide prevention measures or strategies in addition to monitoring. And thank you for explaining those earlier. I want to ask about families now. Are there any of those measures that are directed to the support of families of veterans to try to bring families into um, a suicide prevention um, strategy or framework around the veteran, for example. Yes, there are, and, what are they? but there are more that I, we want to do. So um, certainly, with families, uh, over the recent years, we've been expanding the eligibility for access to open arms, um, where families now can um, seek that support, so that open arms is understanding where there might be risk. Um, we established the position of the Veterans Family Advocate as a commissioner on our repatriation uh, commission and our military rehabilitation and compensation commission just to engage with families to ensure that any policies or programs that we were developing always had the, the, the visibility of what's important to families. And um, we will continue to do that work to um, um, work out where the risks are and educating families about what is available, and by connecting once again with defence um, through life, through military service, and importantly at those transition seminars, to talk to the families and the members about what is available through DVA once a member has transitioned. Does DVA report on the proportion of open arms funding that finds its way to the support of families as opposed to veterans? Is, is that available publicly? I'll, I'll have to check that for right. you. I'm, do, I'm, not assure, I'm not sure if it breaks it down to that level in our reporting. Do, do you know roughly uh, what that proportion no, might sorry, be? No, sorry, I don't. In addition to open arms and, um, in, in effect, the policy advice that you might receive from the um, vet, veteran family advocate, uh, what else is 
provided to families from DVA when a veteran is experiencing poor mental health, suicidality, chronic or enduring pain, substance abuse, those, those risk factors, those um, very challenging and difficult life circumstances that can apply to some veterans. In addition to open arms, counselling being available, mm -hmm. what concrete activities are taking place as opposed to simply what policy advice might you receive from the advocate? Mm -hmm. Is it simply the open arms counselling at present? So, so in addition to open arms counselling, there are also programs that we fund um, for families and for a family that will approach us if they do um, have concerns with their veteran uh, partner or sibling or or um, son or daughter, um, that we can actually fund those programs and we do so. And, and when you say programs, can you give some illustrative examples of what you mean? Are they programs available locally for families to, to, to what, learn things? What sort of programs? So are they're they? programs for the veteran who can um, participate in uh, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, or they can go to um, different facilities that can support with uh, mental health um, counselling, um, and we connect the family and the veteran to those facilities. Um, for the families themselves, they can also access some um, counselling support through Open Arms. So it's not in addition to Open Arms. I'm sorry. So the programs aren't in addition to. To the open. The no. pro there aren't programs for families as such. There's programs for veterans. That's correct. You mentioned. But there aren't programs for families. I thought a minute ago you were saying that there were. Now, for families to connect their veteran, my apologies. So, for right. families to connect the veteran uh, to support and services. All right. Look, I, I just want to um, put up just something from DVA's own website, which um, I think the operator will be able to do as I speak, and it, it's just to illustrate that well-known and important um, motto or mission statement that DVA publishes quite widely, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. We support those who serve or have served in defence of our nation and their families. And you know, that's just an example of it appearing in, in dark blue above... Um, above the, the blue block mm -hmm. of colour on the page. And that, that is widely uh, published by DVA as a summary of its mission. Is that correct, That's Ms correct. Cosson? And thank you, Operator, we can, we can take it down. Um, I just want to, I mean, ask you just to explain the limits are of the support that can be provided in broad terms. Firstly, you're not supporting all veterans, are you? No. That, no. It, it, it requires a proactive step by a veteran to apply for a benefit or seek services from open arms for that veteran to, um, to become a client of DVA, is that right? It used to be that case, um, but since 2016, uh, where we had the early engagement model, we now know everyone who enlists in the Australian Defence Force. And you, you refer to that in your statement. What are the measures being taken to try to reach back past 2016 to engage with that large cohort of the veteran community who didn't have the benefit of early engagement? So we have done a few things. Firstly, um, we've expanded our footprint through our Services Australia around the country. They've got 318 shopfronts, government service shopfronts, um, so that the, if veterans um, do attend, they can uh, uh, seek information about veteran services. But also, importantly, the census I mentioned, the Australian census last year, where we asked the question, first time that that has ever been asked in our um, census in Australia, so that we start to know um, more about our veteran community. But well, let's just take the census. Um, you're not saying that you would have access to the identities of the people who answer the question in the census, no, that's are correct. you? No. Um, so that will give you. Uh, aggregated and de-identified data about the size of the veteran population but and, and perhaps its distribution in, in places. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And its age demographics and so forth. But it won't 
allow you to um, be in touch with the with the individual veteran, will it? It won't have direct contact with an individual, as you said correctly, it's de-identified, but importantly it is showing us where our veteran communities are and that uh, through uh, other mechanisms such as our wellbeing centres to see where there's a, um, a shortage of veteran services, that will be really important to then start to engage with a, a broader community. You were asked a question in your statement, it's on page four, it was questioned for, in your opinion, should DVA be resourced and equipped to contact all veterans before, during and after transition from the ADF? And you pointed out there's early engagement with veterans uh, from 2016. Um, you're not currently resourced to support all veterans in that sense, are you? No. If you had the resources to support all who have served would there be opportunities to prevent suicidality, suicide risks, poor mental health and well wellbeing comes at an earlier stage than is currently the case, do you think? Most of the veterans we don't know probably don't need us, don't need the support of DVA. Um, they've transitioned from their military service and I would, if we were resourced to know all veterans, I would like to think that could contribute to any um, reduction in um, risk of, of suicide. I mean, it's a, a, an issue uh, for us to be connected to the broader health system as well, because that's another area that there is no veteran identifier. If someone does present to an emergency department, um, and they have had suicidal ideation unless they've actually declared to the emergency department they're a veteran. We don't know them. So there are opportunities there that we can expand that reach to um, find ways to, to help prevent early. Um, there are enormous opportunities there, Mr Gray. Yeah. And what sort of scale of additional resourcing would be needed to fulfil a function of that breadth? I probably won't put a number on that because um, when I was mentioning earlier, there are so many pieces to um, the, the whole landscape for um, the veteran community and it's not just DVA. Um, and I think that would be important to just understand where it all fits and where DVA fits in that whole system of our support to the community. I want to ask you about another aspect of that brief mission statement that we support those who serve or have served. And I just want to unpack the expectations that you think might be generated by that statement of, of, of a promise of support. And in particular, I need to go to the topic of claims processing. Um, you, you agree, don't you, that a statement like that is in effect an implied promise that if people approach DVA, there'll be a timely response and people will be kept informed. That's the intent. And that intent isn't being met at the moment, is it? No, it's not. And you know, don't you, from work that's been done for DVA by Professor Alex Colley, that claims processing can have an adverse effect on the mental health of veterans uh, making claims, particularly if there are delays. That's correct. And that, that work was done in March 2019, wasn't it? That's correct. And there have been uh, um, concerns raised with DVA at the highest level in the veteran community about claims processing delays and related matters. Yes. And we've got an example I'll, um, in this tender bundle. I'll take you to that now. It's the document I mentioned a little earlier, Commissioners, tender bundle item 22. Uh, and I just seek Mr Fordham's um, response to my request for clarification about whether I can display those pages without his objection. No issue, thank you. Thank you very much. 
So I'll ask the operator to display that that document not going to the first page, please, operator. Just going straight. So I'll, I'll read out the document ID, DVA 5010002, stop 1812. But we'll go, we'll skip the first page because it has personal information on it. Uh, and we'll go to page 1893, please, operator. And Ms. Cosson, I'll just, um, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at this document in the lead up to preparation for giving evidence today. I think I have. I'll wait until it pops up. It's, 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 it's an e-sort meeting. Um, yes. It, it's a submission and then I think minutes of a discussion, even though the document is described as ESO agenda, mm -hmm. it seems to have minutes of a discussion and the date was the 17th. One. Mm -hmm. Now, you, um, have you had a chance to familiarise yourself with this document in preparation for giving your evidence? I, th I believe so. If we can scroll up a little bit. It's a, I believe this one is a member's submission um, at yes. ESORT. We seek submissions from yes. members of ESORT, yes. That's right. And uh, did, you, um, did you have any familiarity with this document before preparing to give your evidence? Uh, in this hearing? I, I would have attended the ESORT. I chair right. the ESORT. Good. And, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to that page because it's got a whole lot of names, but I can see that you do, so mm -hmm. thank you. And do you actually have an independent recollection of this issue being raised in, in this submission and in a couple of other submissions and a discussion ensuing? I certainly recall many discussions around our claims processing at ESORT. This particular submission, um, I... I would I have to have a good look at it again. Okay, so. well, let's have a look and then I'm going to ask you for how long have these sorts of issues been sure. raised in eSort. Mm -hmm. uh, and eSort, just to um, give the, I think the commissioners know, but if, just to give the public a brief description mm -hmm. of what it is, what is eSort? Certainly. So it's an acronym. Uh, it stands for the Ex-Service Organisation Roundtable. It comprises um, presidents and chairs of national ex-service and veteran support organisations. And I chair it in my capacity as the uh, president of the Repatriation Commission and chair of the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Commission and has representatives from the department and defence um, and also the CEO of ComSuper as a member of the commission. And we convene members of ESORT and uh, they put forward their submissions and we consider them and discuss them at those meetings. Thank you. And the members, uh, they include at least or perhaps consist of um, organisations that provide support to veterans that are sometimes known as ex-service organisations, ESOs, is that They right? are predominantly ex-service organisations and the presidents, their national organisations sit on ESORT. But it's not all such organisations, is it? It's a, it's a select number of those organisations, is that right? Yes, there are a few that do not sit on it, that's correct. Well, there are, there are in fact thousands of support organisations, aren't there? So there are more than a few that don't sit on it. Sorry, there are thousands of ex-service organisations, absolutely, but um, they're not all national. Um, so on the ESORT we have selected national organisations, such you. as an RSL or Legacy National Known Organisations. Thank you. Now, um, this first page that I've taken you to, uh, at the bottom of the page, it's submitted by the Defence Force Welfare Organisation, a uh, big pardon, Defence Force Welfare Association. Yes. And uh, the title is Unacceptable Claims Resolution Claims. And there are a number of things sought as desired outcomes. Firm action to reduce the Merka Durka claim back backlog, uh, Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act and the amending act that applies the Safety Re Rehabilitation and Compensation Act to defence related claims, which is commonly called DERCA, that's yeah. right, isn't it? I'll just be referring to those as Merka and DERCA. Um, another action is that it must, that the backlog settlement time must be reduced to 90 days. Do you understand that to be an aim of having a target time for time taken to process the claim as a maximum of 90 days? 
for Merca initial liability. That's correct. Uh, but but the desired outcome that's being sought, presumably that's um, in effect a desired outcome of a reduction to 90 days time taken to process across the board. Yes. Your target is um, not always 90 days. For some categories, the target is a little higher, isn't it? That's correct. Um, but in fact, those targets are not being met at the moment by a long margin. In fact, the, the time taken to process claims is well in excess of the targets. That's correct. And there's a request for advice by DBA on action taken to check on the wellbeing of veterans and their families waiting to be allocated a delegate. That's correct. And there's also a reference to the Productivity Commission report recommendations and a request for DBA's advice on that. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll come to that as a separate topic. We need to disentangle some of these issues, but that's obviously of concern to this organisation and there's details then provided under background and issues for consideration. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one, of the, one of the concerns that's raised is uh, about average staffing level cap, that's at C. Um, is, is average staffing level often referred to as ASL? That's correct. And what is the ASL cap? Uh, this year it's too no, far. I, not, not what is the figure What's but the figure? what is it in concept what, and what does it constrain your agency DVA to do? So all Commonwealth agencies have applied to them an ASL cap, uh, which is intended to keep the public service to a reasonable level across all Commonwealth agencies. And um, we have, um, and that comprises um, a, an averaging of your Australian public service staff, ongoing and non-ongoing staff across a year. And um, we're obliged to um, comply with that cap. Okay. And just while we're asking about that, does that only, re only relate to the employment of ongoing and non-ongoing Australian public service staff? Yes. So there's flexibility outside the ASL cap for an agency to use, say, labour hire to obtain short-term contracted labour. Is that right? If they have funding to pay for the labour hire, but they do have yep. that discretion, yes. Okay, that's a topic we'll be returning to. Now, um, if we go to the next page, a submission, it's in fact a two-page submission, 1894 to 5, and it's a submission by um, a particular person uh, from the Royal Australian Regiment Corporation Limited. Yes. Now, it's, it's covering similar subject matter to the Defence Force Welfare Association submission, isn't it, but, but raising different detail. Correct. And... In the de desired outcome, there's, um, well, and the, and the title itself, there's a focus on workforce issues at DVA. Uh, the title is, what is the appropriate strategic workforce for DVA considering full-time permanent contract labour, casual part-time, and also other matters, gender, and employment of veterans? And um, you can, you've got all that yes. available to you, Ms. Cosson, thank you. And I'll just um, I'll just go to a third submission, which is uh, at one eight nine six to seven, another two page submission submitted by a particular person on behalf of the Vietnam Veterans Association of Australia Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And again, sort of overlapping subject matter. The title is Reports that Time Taken by DVA to Process Claims by Veterans May Exceed 12 Months. And in fact, this Royal Commission has heard evidence that um, at about this time, or a month or so later in 2021, there were emails being sent out saying that for certain categories of claims, there were times approximating um, two years uh, for allocation to a delegate. Um, and you're familiar with the evidence that was yes. given at the, the yes, hearing? Yes, I am. And you don't have any basis to dispute the accuracy of that evidence, do you? No. No. Um, you knew about 
that problem before hearing that evidence, I assume? Yes, I did. Yeah. A desired outcome of the um, Vietnam Veterans Association of Australia submission, uh, in addition to addressing the backlog itself, includes the dissemination, this is at the bottom of the box, desired outcome, the dissemination of information regarding this matter that can be distributed to ESO's veterans and advocates. And just pausing there um, and going back to the mission statement of support and the expectation that might be generated by that, if, if DVA is promising to support veterans and yet there are very, very long claims processing times which are in, in effect inhibiting the provision of support in a timely manner, there's going to be a gap between the expectation generated by that mission or that promise and what's actually occurring. Would you agree with that? Yes, I do. And the very existence of the gap and uncertainty about uh, when that support will be provided could be a source of anxiety, to use that expression colloquially, and other adverse impacts on the state of mind of the person wishing to make the claim. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. So wouldn't it be important to tell the veteran community in a transparent way and an accessible way the bad news, how long it is taking to process the claims? Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes. I have been um, looking at the annual report of the DVA and including up to the most recent annual report on the transparency portal, I can't see anything in the annual report which actually tells the public and the veteran community anything in plain terms about how long it takes for DVA to process claims and what the waiting times might be for the various categories of key claim. It's not there, is it? Not in so many words, no, and I think we could do better and we have been working with some of the ex-service community to see how we can better um, publish what it, what is that wait time. Well, there, there are six key categories of claim that are high volume, aren't there? There's initial liability for each of VEA, that's yes. Veterans Entitlements Act claims, and Merca and Durka. And then there's disability pension claims under VEA and permanent impairment claims under Merca and Durka. Correct. So there are six altogether, and they're the highest volume claims. And quite a number of those categories, I think all of those categories have difficulties with waiting time, but particular, in particular Merca and Durka, is that right? Certainly Merca, um, initial liability is the largest. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a difficult thing for DVA to actually publish what the time current time taken to process claims in each of those six categories is at any given point in time or from month to month, would it? In fact, you receive internal reporting on that matter. So it, if I can, on um, timeliness, I agree we're not meeting timeliness targets and that's quite clear in our annual report. Um, some claims will be processed a lot quicker than others. And we, um, and I believe you've heard before about how we screen uh, the claims. And um, I'm happy to publish whatever is helpful to the, uh, the community, but some claims will wait a long time um, if it's not seen, if the veteran has not indicated they have an urgent need or are in um, financial difficulty or, or needing access to treatment. So we've got a range of measures in place that if somebody needs our urgent attention to the claim, they should come to us and let us know that. Uh, but I'm happy to, to publish timings, but you're correct, sometimes it can be 200 days, other times it can be within a matter of weeks. If, if certain criteria are met, a claim might be expedited for very prompt attention. That's correct. Um, but the average time taken to process claims is well in excess of the targets and um, in particular for, for uh, Merca is... Uh, what, more than 200 days at the moment? They can be, that's correct. Some and in the annual report, just to um, refer back to something you just said, 
you said there's timeliness reporting in the annual report and we, we can go to it if necessary, but in fact all that's reported is a comparative, yeah. um, comparative percentage uh, by reference to the previous year's timeliness, correct? That's correct. So what that tells you is whether there's been an improvement or a deterioration in time taken to process claims since the data of the previous financial year. That's great. It doesn't tell you how long on average it takes to process no. those claims. And it doesn't even tell you uh, in absolute terms what the current um, claims on hand might be. Mm, no. Um, and that percentage is, with respect, virtually meaningless, at least without a lot of homework trying to work out from previous years um, what the uh, outcome might have been and when back in history there might have been a, um, an outcome that met the timeliness target that is um, average processing time was within the target, the 90-day target, the 100-day target that TV mm -hmm. has for that category, correct? Mm, correct. Shouldn't the average taken time to process claims and the number of claims of particular categories on hand be available to the veteran community on the website and updated every month? There's a challenge with that, that that might also um, impact on expectations because if you look at the oldest and the, um, the newest claims and how quickly we can uh, process them, it might then um, create another expectation. But as I said, I'm open to sharing as much information as I have with ESORT on what we're seeing in the claims pattern. Um, and I agree that we need to ensure that um, we are communicating and, and I want to do that. And those concerns you raise about creating other kinds of false expectation, or my word false, but yeah. other, other yeah. problems with expectations, they could be addressed by words accompanying the data, couldn't they? Yes, they could. And that, really that should be done as a matter of urgency, shouldn't it? And McKinsey's identified that as well, that we should um, be more transparent and I fully support that recommendation. And rather than just the general aspiration of being more transparent, I've put to you some particular proposals. Do you agree that those proposals are workable and appropriate? Uh, yes, I do. Now, just moving on from that aspect of the Vietnam Veterans Association of Australia submission, um, there then appears a page, and this is where the commissioners need your help to um, explain what occurred at the meeting. At 1898, go to that page please, operator. There's then a page and it goes over the page too with some ASL cap and actuals um, information in a table. And it's entitled, the page is entitled Strategic Workforce at DVA. Mm -hmm. And it, it's led by a person whose name appears because he's a high, he holds high executive rank, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so that it's okay to refer to his name. Um, we've got um, then discussion, there's the note of recommendation that are being discussed. It doesn't actually include the Vietnam Veterans of Association, beg your pardon, Vietnam Veterans Association of Australia in that heading. So I'm not quite sure whether that submission was discussed at all, was it? Do you recall? I can't recall, sorry. All right. Do you recall any discussion about yes. transparency of information? And the words used by Vietnam Veterans Association was the dissemination of information regarding this matter. Yes. All right. And what was the outcome of that discussion on the dissemination of information? So we did share with ESORT members um, our current claims patterns and what we were seeing. But not the public? Not the public. Yeah. Because the line in the desired outcome didn't wasn't limited to ESOs. It included veterans and advocates, which essentially means the public, doesn't it? When we share with ESORT, they're welcome to share that information with their constituents. I but see. we so don't make some, it public. So some advocates and veterans who are associated with those members of ESORT That's correct. could ask for it. 
Yes. Now, um, there's then some information provided, presumably, by the Chief Executive Officer under purpose and issues for discussion. There's a number of dot points. Is that right? The issues for discussion are, in effect, a summary of information conveyed by the Chief Operating Officer? That's correct. So the Chief Operating Officer briefed, yes. All right. Now, I, I, I won't take the time. We're never going to get through this mm. um, important examination in the time we've got if I, if I go line by line, but... Have you familiarised yourself with this content in preparation for your evidence? No, not in a, right. not a lot of detail, no. Okay. Well, it's... All right. Well, it, it, it doesn't... Um, have, have a quick read of it. Have a quick read of it now. To yourself, yeah. Yes, I understand broadly what it's presenting to ESORT. Yeah. It, there was um, a request for um, at least in the Defence Force Welfare Association submission, a request for firm action to be taken to reduce the current Merkadurka claim backlog and, and other related issues. And in the, in the body of the Royal Australian Regiment submission, there was a point made that the permanent full-time public sector workforce in the department is capped at a certain number, which was 1,615 mm -hmm. at that time. That's right. This is nowhere near enough people to cover the workload on hand, said the Royal Australian Regiment Association. And um, there was reference to contracting additional people but then references to high staff turnover amongst that cohort reduces reducing efficiency in training workers and processing applications. Now, would you agree with me that the, the response of the Chief Operating Officer while giving some facts about the composition of the workforce doesn't actually engage with those complaints about um, the need to reduce the backlog and the issues driven by the ASL cap and the use of contracted labour to, to uh, fill workforce capacity gaps. I object to that because the heading is issues for discussion. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a response. Okay. Um, noting that the heading is just issues for discussion, the bullet points that appear don't actually proposed solutions to those issues that I just mentioned, do, do they? No. I still object to it for the same reason. Well, I'm just, I'm just asking a question about whether those bullet points address those issues and then we can ask whether there was any discussion about those issues. I maintain the objection. I'll allow the question. Please proceed. So noting that there is a heading, issues for discussion, and maybe these are just intended to be issues for discussion, the issues that are identified don't themselves provide any proposed solutions to the, um, to the, back, to the, to the backlog, the issues about the uh, times taken to process claims in the earlier submissions or the effect of the ASL cap driving the use of contracted labour and that creating inefficiencies in claims processing, do they? The issues are for, were for discussion and the discussion went into what does that mean and how could the ex-service community help us in understanding um, the impact it was having. So just stopping you there, the, the issues, the dot points that appear don't provide answers, don't, no. pro don't provide proposed solutions to those topics. My, que my next question, was there further discussion about those proposed solutions? Yes. Yeah. And what was the tenor of the discussion, was there any conclusion reached on reducing the backlog? We needed to reduce... We acknowledged that we um, had a backlog and we needed to do everything we possibly could to get on top of that backlog. OK. Secondly, was there any discussion or solution proposed about the ASL cap issue? That is not how... This, the ASL cap is set by government. There's nothing I can do about the ASL cap. So my question is, was there any discussion or solution proposed 
about that? There was a lot of discussion and there there was uh, no solution proposed, no. Okay. And the use of contracted labour to fill capacity gaps in claims processing and that leading to inefficiencies in claims processing, A, was there discussion on that? B, were there any solutions proposed? There were discussions around uh, the um, hiring of labour hire to assist us in the reduction of that backlog. Were there any solutions proposed um, to the inefficiency issues that were raised by the uh, Royal Australian Regiment? Other than training our workforce to, to remove that um, inefficiency and to um, have a look at the process and we, um, we've had many uh, reviews into what our process internally to the department on how we can remove some of the barriers in the process. So that type of discussion may not have been had at that ESOL, but we have had discussions around that. And you mentioned at the outset before we went into the detail of this document that in fact there have been many occasions on which these issues have been raised without holding you to precisely which of those issues have been raised on each occasion. How far back in ESORT meetings, to the best of your recollection, have those issues been raised? Um, for several years. Um, I, I won't try and remember when it started, but it's certainly been a topic of discussion for several years. Okay. Um, at hearing block two, there was that... Um, panel of, uh, and I mentioned it in, in my opening remarks, there was some evidence heard about these issues of claims processing at DVA and there was a, a witness from McKinsey, Mr Bruce Hunter, and there was a panel of three uh, wit witnesses from DVA who also gave evidence about claims processing issues uh, as at... Um, February this year, but by reference to data that was a little earlier. Mm -hmm. And Ms Cosson, have you had an opportunity to um, apprise yourself of the most recent available internal DVA reports on the state of the backlog, that is the number of claims that have been uh, lodged by applicants for benefits um, with DVA but have not yet been determined? Um, I am aware of the broad numbers of um, claims, yes. Um, do, do you have uh, with you now any internal management reports on those numbers and the time taken to process those claims? I don't have the numbers with me, um, but I've certainly um, seen the internal documents on how we're tracking with... Um, the claims received and the claims determined. And when do you have that data available to the time taken to process claims in those six categories that we mentioned earlier? Do you have that data available to the end of March? Yes, I do. And what's the current time taken to process the um, Merca initial liability claims at the moment? So it will, average, the average. I don't have the average time taken. What I'm monitoring uh, are the claims that we're receiving and the claims that we're determining and which ones are over 300 days um, to get an understanding of where we need to allocate our resources. So we track that weekly. And what percentage of Merca initial liability claims are as yet undetermined and are over 300 days? I don't have the number oh, in front okay. of me, sorry. Um, well... We'll be asking the DVA to produce those internal yes. reports. Um, we'll do that soon after this hearing. Yes. Thank you. Uh, are you able to just give the Royal Commissioners do, doing the best you can, mm -hmm. not holding you to the detail, mm -hmm. an impression as to whether the numbers um, of uh, outstanding claims and whether the duration of average time taken to process claim in the six categories is uh, in an improved state since um, the end of last year or is it roughly the same? 
It's the uh, claims on hand, roughly the same, but I, I can offer that because of the ongoing training of the new staff that we brought on board, um, we're making more determinations, so that is good, but the number of claims being received continues to rise. Um, so you won't see a, a big difference in the number of claims on hand, but you will in the number of determinations. And um, in relation to those over 300 days, we did have a, a tiger team that we uh, put to some of those and we did see a considerable improvement in, in those. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt, but if it helps my friend, we were asked last night for the weekly on-hand monitoring report from 10 April 2022 and it was provided this morning. I'm instructed we only just got it and we're processing it so that it can be available on the computer screen. So I may return to that, Ms. Cosson, when, when that's available yes. for display. Um, I just want to ask you about something you just said and I, I know you noted some, um, some good news mm -hmm. in, in processing capacity on the processing capacity side of the ledger, if I can put it that way. Yes. But there's another side to the ledger, isn't there? Yes. And that could be described as demand mm -hmm. uh, in economic terms, or perhaps in in more accessible in a more accessible way, we'd refer to it as the number of new claims coming in. That's correct. And I think you just said the number of new claims coming in is continuing to increase. Yes. Right now, was that this is, this is going to be a topic we'll spend some time on forecasting of demand or forecasting of movement in the numbers of new claims in various categories. Did DVA um, have uh, any sort of forecast or appreciation of what the numbers of new cl claims were likely to be this year as at um, the end of last year? Do you understand my question? Is yes, I do. Yeah. Um, no, we're not good at forecasting. Um, what we look at um, are trends that we looking back and we look at trends and we do have a, a model that we use for trying to um, estimate what resources we need to meet that demand. Um, but if the demand continues to outstrip our capacity, that's when we are experiencing the, um, the backlog. I see. Um, McKinsey, your pardon, McKinsey are a consulting firm whom you brought in to DVA in late 2021 to perform a claims processing, claims process diagnostic and to formulate a plan for initiatives to, to reduce and eliminate the backlog. That's right, isn't That's it? That's correct. And the commissioners have heard evidence in, in hearing block two from those witnesses I mentioned on that. Um, I'll just display the overview document um, for you and you can go to it if you wish to. It's DVA 0006, 0001, 0001 and you've got a hard copy there, do you? That's, that's terrific. Now, um, without going to the detail of it now unless you need to, are you able to say uh, whether the... Um, whether McKinsey was given data in effect forecasting what uh, volumes the DVA expected of new claims over the period from the beginning of 2022 through to the end of 2023 for the purposes of its diagnostic? So McKinsey's did have a look at the data that we use in our funding model and they um, had their own funding model to have a look at what were the trends that we were seeing. So they established some trend lines to say this is what we think would be the base on the growth, but already we're seeing growth above what McKinsey had uh, forecast. Thank you. That was going to be my next question. So already you're seeing growth in new claims above the assumptions that McKinsey made when it formulated its process diagnostic and high level implementation plan. Is that right? That's correct. All right. Um, pardon me for a minute.
Um, Ms Cosson, no doubt you're quite familiar with the Productivity Commission's report of June 2019. Yes, I am. And I just want to, I don't think I need to go to it perhaps, but in Chapter 9 there's an analysis of DVA's claims processing and at that time the Productivity Commission is um, quite complementary of DVA's performance in claim, claims processing, noting, for example, the veteran-centric reform and my service, that's the electronic portal for making claims. That's correct. Had there been, in effect, a, at that time, perhaps with the benefit of hindsight, temporary improvement in claims processing times at about the time of the Productivity Commission's review due to my service and veteran-centric reform? Is that, is that your impression of, of um, what was happening in 2018-19? Yes, and we've seen considerable growth since then. And you've seen considerable growth in new applications since then? Correct. But at the time the Productivity Commission was reviewing the data, mm -hmm. as reflected in its report in June 2019, there, there were... Um, generally speaking, um, good claims processing times outcome and you were within target? That's correct. And it's, it's not really, um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't put my hand on a graph that shows uh, uh, the entire time scale from June 2019 to now, but I'll just ask you in general, and perhaps later in the inquiry, in, in the inquiry we may be able to generate such a graph, but can I just ask you for your general impression, and I'm not going to hold you to the detail. Mm -hmm. um, it, it appears that from a reasonably good position in at the at the time of the the generation of the data the Productivity Commission was looking at, say a little before June 2019, to the present time, there's been an enormous um, accrual of a backlog in claims that have not been processed in a timely manner. And uh, I want to ask you for uh, your, um, your views on what has caused that. It's quite an alarming growth in those claims that haven't been determined over about two and a half to three years, isn't it? It's a considerable growth, absolutely. And it's there's currently, you say in your statement at paragraph 94, 60,000 claims on hand, mm -hmm. 60,101 um, claims on hand. Now, not all of those claims are outside your targets for, for no, um, that's processing, but many of them are. Is that that's, right? That's correct. And there's a potential nexus between... Um, claims processing times as identified by Professor Colley and risks to mental health. you agree with that? That's correct. In your opinion, are delays in claims processing at DVA capable of raising the risks that veterans making those claims could take their own lives? I believe that the, um, the claims backlog um, is, could be a contributing factor, absolutely. And this inquiry does need to understand how that backlog was permitted to accrue and expand to the size that it has. And I'm going to ask you some questions that will, in effect, provide an opportunity for you to explain how this has arisen mm -hmm. to our Royal Commissioners. Mm -hmm. So what were the key uh, root causes of the accrual and growth in the backlog, in your opinion? I see there are many drivers for the, the growth in the, the claims. Um, firstly, uh, we certainly encouraged members who are still serving in the Australian Defence Force to lodge a claim at point of injury or illness. So they didn't experience what our Vietnam veteran cohort experienced, where there were considerable delays in the lodgement of a claim and then uh, seeking the evidence to support their claim. So that early engagement model is one and uh, 
about 60% of those 60,000 claims that uh, you referenced are current serving members. Um, and secondly, with uh, veteran-centric reform where we made it easier for veterans to lodge a claim online um, was another significant contributor uh, to the growth. I am pleased to say non-liability healthcare, which was introduced so that veterans could access uh, free um, mental health services if they needed it, was another important initiative, but it also then changed the definition of our veteran. And as a result of that, we saw an enormous spike of more veterans coming to the department to seek um, um, access to the, the white card for that non-liability healthcare. So a lot of it was good um, and um, the, the foundation for those changes was to, to actually connect with more veterans. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, department's capacity to keep up with that growth in demand we just was not there. So just taking the white card, it doesn't actually take any time to process a claim for a white card in the sense that... Mm -hmm we've been discussing, does it? They're, they're not in the back... Those applications for a white card are not in the back you've been describing? No, it, because it's not based on liability. For non-liability healthcare, you don't need to link um, access to mental health services to your service. So you can actually go, ac go and access treatment and we'll pay for that. Um, so that doesn't contribute to the backlog. You can use it. But if you want to seek um, liability link uh, for potentially compensation, um, then, yes, that will be in the backlog. So are you saying that it had a secondary effect, that is that some people who received the white card then made a claim that they wouldn't otherwise have made? That's correct. Your, your thinking? Yes. I see. And with the veteran-centric reform, did you forecast at the time of the veteran-centric reform, big pardon, just I'll go back and ask a preliminary question. Did you have in mind that the veteran-centric reform would make it much easier for a veteran to make an application? Yes. And does it then follow that you should have forecast an increase in demand as a result of the veteran-centric reform? Yes, I agree. We should um, have. Did you forecast an increase in mm, demand? Not to the level that we have seen, no. I'll just finish the question. Sorry. Did you forecast an increase in demand uh, as a result of the veteran-centric reform at all prior to the time of introducing the veteran-centric reform? Yes, we did anticipate, but not to the level we have seen. Thank you. And um, was that in 2018? Uh, it would have been in 2016, 17. We were looking at veteran-centric reform. So uh, 17, 18 is when we started the actual um, um, uh, program of Thank investment. You. And when did my service go live? Ooh. I think it was at the uh, around 2018, towards the and, end of 2018. And was it then that you saw the increase in uh, applications beyond the level at which you'd forecast the increase in applications? We've seen that steadily rise each year, yes. And did it begin in 2018? I'm sorry, each year, but it, it has been over several years, yes. Right. Um, the percentage of uh, – so early engagement began in 2016. That's correct. And the percentage of serving members in the ADF who are in the backlog, yes. who have claims that are in the backlog, is 60%. Is that yes, what you're saying? Yes, that's correct. Thank For you. For Merca initial liability. Yep. Um, are they prioritised uh, in any different way under any sort of triage process so that um, – they either receive greater priority or, or less priority than uh, ex-serving members of the ADF who are in the community? So they will um, be prioritised if they are in the process of transitioning and particularly those that are medically transitioning. If they are not transitioning, then they are not prioritised. And if, if they're not prioritised because they're not medically discharging or otherwise transitioning, mm -hmm. um, are they on a level uh, footing with veterans in the community who haven't attracted um, their own uh, priority? No. Are they on a, they're not on a, serving members are not on a level footing in, in the backlog with veterans in the community? We do not prioritise current serving members because we do not necessarily see they're at um, risk because they've got employment and okay. medical treatment. What, what about veterans in the general community 
do you, do you give them priority generally? Over current serving members, yes, and then there are priorities within um, that within the veteran community. Thank you. And you described some of them a little yes. earlier. For example, if certain conditions are met that you regard as risk factors, they receive uh, more, more prompt claims processing. Is that right? That's correct, because we can connect them with service while their claim is being processed. Uh, they can get medical treatment, which is provisional access to medical treatment. Um, they can actually receive financial support through a veteran's payment if they are waiting for their, their claim to be processed. But, I th well, I'll just ask it again. Perhaps I've already asked this, but you haven't evaluated, have you, how effective those prioritisation measures are in addressing uh, risks to mental wellbeing? I'd say no. Now, can I just ask you um, about the McKinsey initiatives? Yes. And thank you for understanding what I meant when I said that, but I'll, I'll help you out a little further because there were quite a few initiatives discussed, weren't there? But there were 11 initiatives in particular that were initiatives that were not already, well, that McKinsey regarded as not already uh, underway in DVA, but um, that could have a material impact on reducing the backlog and if fully, if these 11 initiatives were fully implemented on certain assumptions, including certain staffing assumptions and demand assumptions, the backlog could be eliminated by mid-2023. That's right, isn't it? Uh, I think they might have said December 23. On, on yeah. certain other yeah, scenarios. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's, let's just go to... Um, the, the document I displayed a short time ago, it's DVA 0006, 0001, 0001, and this is an overview dated 10 December 2021 of McKinsey's work on claims diagnostic and high-level implementation plan. And I believe you have a hard copy yeah. yes, here, Mr. Gosson. And the 11, the 11 key initiatives... Um, were described on, perhaps it's best to start with the, with the initiatives that were already in train um, on page 12, 0012, DVA, the heading of this page is DVA already has six in train or planned initiatives that are expected to improve claims processing. And, you, and you're quite right about the primary assumption being December 2023. On the next page, 0013, um, oh, operator, do you have that document? TVA 0006, 0001, Don't know if we're having a technical dif difficulty, perhaps. DVA 0006, 0001, 0001 is the document we're looking for. Mine says 12. That's it. Thank you, operator. And uh, the first page I just referred to with the six in-train initiatives is on page 12. And I'm not sure if that's coming up. Um, is there an objection to being displayed, Mr. Fordham? I think it's blue shaded. That might be creating a technical difficulty. This has previously been displayed in viewing HB2. Perhaps we'd better um, come back to this. It's coming up on my access to it here. So. Thank you. Perhaps I'll just continue with uh, the commissioners and the witness being able to see the document. 
Yeah, I, I think the problem is we're working from different lists. I'm sorry. I'll try and work it out. I don't think that that is the problem. I've given the code number, Mr Fordham, not the list number, so... It's, it's simply that it's blue shaded. We, we'll come back to whether we can publicly display it, Commissioners. But on page 12, Ms Cosson, using your hard copy, uh, there were six in-train or planned initiatives with, thank you, Operator, with estimated impacts on claims. And is it still the case that those in-train initiatives are being implemented by DVA? Yes, they are. Have they actually been completed? That is, has their implementation been completed yet? I have been advised that they have been fully implemented. Thank you. And we'll then go to the next page, 0013, and there are 11 further initiatives that uh, McKinsey describes as being prioritised in order to clear the backlog by December 2023. And there's, um, they appear with initiative numbers in the second column on the left side, for example, PROC02, support clients to submit completed claims yes. and so on. And there is in the middle of the page uh, a row, or perhaps slightly to the left of the middle of the page, a row entitled Estimated Impact on December 2023 Backlog. That's I'm sorry, not a row, a column. Yeah, a column slightly to the middle of the page, estimated impact. And do you see the um, colour coding of the bars that appear in that column? There's a, a, a deeper blue colour for estimated sizing conservative and a lighter blue colour for estimated sizing optimistic. Yes, I do. And the impact, estimated impact on December 2023 backlog by number of claims for PROC2 is about 11,000 mm -hmm. and it's shaded for optimistic. It's an optimistic estimate. Do you That's agree with my interpretation yes, of, yes, of that item as an illustration of how this works? Thank you. So if now, anyone wants to display that document, there is no issue. Thank you, Mr Fordham. Now, um, in your statement, in response to a question the Royal Commission asked you, you have provided a report on the status of implementation of these 11 initiatives, correct? That's correct. And we'll just go to that now. And I don't know if um, the operator could please try to... Well, I think, I think these, these documents are too big across the page and we won't be able to display them both at once. I'll just ask the operator to go to ECO 6, which begins at page um, 54. That's the summary of the initiatives. And we've just looked at the McKinsey version of those initiatives. Now we're going to look at your table reporting on implementation of them at attachment. So six, page 54, we see the first of those, which is, um, this is, this is a different order uh, to, to oh, these initiatives. Sorry. No, that's all right. But you've started with POP02 instead of PROCO2. They look a little similar, but they're actually quite different initiatives, yes. aren't they? Yes. yes. If we want to find PROC2, which stands for process two, doesn't it? We go to the next page and we see this, this is just an illustration. I'm not going to do this for all okay. 11. Um, we see across the top rows of page 55, uh, we've got some green shading to the left, quite prominently left PROC02, yes. and then all of the light green shaded cells to the right of where that appears are the detailed components of that initiative, is that right? That's correct. And you've then reported on uh, whether they've started, what their completion date is expected to be and made comments. Let's just take the, the first row across the top, complete claim applications defined and published on website and my service and metric for complete claim applications defined. 
and then there's a McKinsey start date and a McKinsey completion date. And those start dates and completion dates were December 21 and January 22. Now, you didn't start, the, well, it says actual start date, it just says started. It doesn't actually say when that started. That's correct. Do you know off the top of your head when that started? I'd say this year. And in any, in any event, not by the date that McKinsey anticipated. That's correct. And But it has started now and it started sometime this year. Yes, we've been working with the ex-service community on that one too. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. And your projected completion date is the end of May. Is yes, that right? That's so great. that just taking that one, that's going to be some four months later mm -hmm. than McKinsey anticipated. So that would have a corresponding impact on their optimistic estimate of um, reduction on a reduction of the backlog. Do you agree with that? It's going to be that much later that um, this initiative will begin to have that effect and it's a bit hard to say exactly how long it will delay the projected elimination of the backlog, but it will, will delay it beyond what McKinsey predicted. That's correct. And that prediction was itself rather optimistic. You agree? I do. And th this PROC2 was actually one of the, one of the two largest... <coughs> Um, largest impact initiatives that mm -hmm. McKinsey formulated, correct? That's correct. Now, we then see in the comment box, subject to government consideration, and in fact, this appears in a number of yes. uh, the reports of implementation of the McKinsey initiatives. So can I just ask, you prepared this before the budget, before this year's budget in March, I believe, that's correct. Do, is there now, in effect, approval from government in those budget papers for all of these initiatives? Not all. Not all. And are you able to say, well, I won't ask you to do it in the box unless you, you're confident you can do it, but are you able to say which of these is still subject to government consideration? The point being we really need to update this implementation report, don't we, because it sounds like there has been some government consideration and decision mm -hmm. um, since you prepared this implementation report, but that doesn't apply to all of these initiatives. That's correct. Are you able to say where you, from where you're sitting now whether or not PROC2 has been approved by government? I'd rather give you a full update on right. this um, separately if I can, Mr Gray. Okay. That's all right. So, look, so far we've already got growth in demand beyond what was projected at the time that McKinsey did its work mm -hmm. and that undermines McKinsey's prediction of by when the backlog can be eliminated, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. And we've got delay in at least that, the implementation of that initiative and a question mark about whether it's actually still subject to government approval. And we could go through the other initiatives and for some of them at least there'd be a similar conclusion. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. So the McKinsey prediction is unlikely, that is the predi McKinsey prediction or modelling on a somewhat opt optimistic basis in some, in some ways that the backlog could be eliminated by December 2023 is unlikely to be fulfilled. Would you agree with that? I'd agree with that. All right. And have you reassessed within DVA or perhaps in consultation with McKinsey, either way, what the um, – on the, on the basis of the new information you currently know, what the time frame is likely to be before the backlog can be eliminated? So we're having a look now at the um, at modelling to see when that might be. Um, and I, if I'm going to predict, um, it would be early 2024, certainly not December 2023, um, with the onboarding of staff and training and um, subject to some stability in that workforce, um, we're making um, every effort to reduce it. Okay. Now, there's 
perhaps this is very simplistic to refer to this ledger concept, but I, in an earlier question mm -hmm. I referred to demand being one side of the ledger. Um, a very important input into the other side of the ledger, which is the claims processing capacity of DBA, is the workforce performing that work. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes. Now, that issue was itself raised in the ESORT meeting of 17 February 2021 and had been raised in earlier meetings, you thought? Yes. And I want to ask you some questions about workforce. And I know it's tied with the topic of the funding model that the department has, but, but I want to look at workforce first because mm -hmm. that's in effect the enabler of claims processing, and then I'll look at funding in more detail, which is in effect the enabler or an enabler of workforce. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll ask you questions in that sequence. If you need to refer to funding issues in responding to some of the staffing questions, that's quite all right. Mm -hmm. But we'll come to it in a little more detail after we've dealt with staffing. Okay. I want to um, just go back to that uh, question I asked you and the response you gave about the ASL cap and the form of engagement of, of, of workforce to which that relates. And you said that was Australian public service, either ongoing or non-ongoing. That's correct. Can you just briefly describe the difference between ongoing and non-ongoing non Australian mm -hmm. public service staff? Mm -hmm. So ongoing staff are on a permanent contract um, with the public service employed under the Public Service Act. Um, and they're engaged through a, a merit selection process into positions and they have certainty of employment. A non-ongoing uh, APS employee may be engaged uh, not necessarily through a full merit process um, because we uh, did take that step with a number of our contractors to convert them to non-ongoing. Uh, to then go through a merit process to bring them on board as quickly as possible. One of the issues with non-ongoing, one, it does provide flexibility to a for a department if they need to surge or uh, reduce their workforce, but it doesn't give employment certainty for those that are employed on non-ongoing. They can only be employed for up to three years on a contract. And just one other question about the non-ongoing category there. Mm -hmm. We've already just touched on the point about the productivity of the claims processing workforce in the context of some comments made in the ESO forum about mm -hmm. um, contracted labour hire workforce. Um, I'm going to ask you about productivity of labour hire in a minute. What are your views and any analysis that you might have available to you on the productivity of the non-ongoing component of the Australian Public Service workforce in claims processing? Are they as productive as ongoing? I'd say yes. And is that because the non-ongoing have sufficient continuity in the job to acquire the skills needed to become fully productive? That's correct. Okay. So just because they're non-ongoing doesn't mean they might not actually continue in the job in claims processing in DVA for a period of many years? That's correct. All right. It's just that what the DVA isn't committed to... Uh, long-term employment of a non-ongoing APS member. Is that so right? Sometimes the non-ongoing can convert into ongoing appointments as well. So it's a, a quite a flexible arrangement where you can, um, if your demand drops, then you have that flexibility with a non-ongoing contract. Okay, thank you. Now, um, there are some points made by McKinsey about productivity mm. of claims processing staff, mm -hmm. but without going to them, uh, unless we need to, are you able to tell the Royal Commissioners in, in rough terms um, what you understand to be the, the, um, the time taken for a claims processing staff member to become fully productive? Mm -hmm. It can take up to uh, six months to be fully trained to be able to make the, the complex decisions um, in a number of our claims categories. So we normally put a time of six months of training. Okay. And in the, it's quite a, quite a long time. Yes. time, isn't it? It is. And uh, over that time, what, the person starts on a very low base of productivity and then moves to, in effect, mm -hmm. full assumed productivity? Is that... That's correct. That, and, and roughly taking the, the, mid, the mean point or 
or on average in that first six months, what's the um, what's the differential? By, by what proportion, what percentage are they less productive than a fully trained member? Do you know? Is it in the order of twenty to thirty percent less productive? Um, we sort of measure it once they've completed three months training, they're fifty percent productive. Um, I think that's what you mean so um, but also importantly team leaders are supervising a little bit more they are making decisions during their training but it depends on the complexity of the decisions okay. until they become fully uh, competent at six months and productive right so at taking the mid at the midpoint they're only about 50 yes. percent as productive as they will be up to six months so maybe as a rough rule of thumb on average they're only half as productive for, for six months correct all right and at the same time other people are supervising them, you just said. That's so are they taken out of the frontline services? No, they're still doing their job, but um, they may not be um, meeting the... They may, may not be at full capacity. Thank you, I understand. Be. You just said that. So it, it, it's going to have an um, impact on the productivity of the person who has to do the training, yes. although they're still in the front line. That's correct. Yep. So staff turnover must then be a significant issue when you're facing a backlog like this and you're trying to have your claims processing area as productive as possible absolutely and i want to ask you now about contracted labor hire workforce um what are the what are the issues there are they more costly or less costly than uh, employing a person at the same level in claims processing from the aps so the actual person that's engaged through the labour hire is paid by their labour hire company and we would pay a little bit above what you would normally pay a public servant at that level. Okay. So they're more costly? Yes. And um, how, how long is the general retention of labour hire staff member in um, claims processing? Have you done that analysis? So we don't actually um, monitor the attrition for our labour hire because they have been employed on 12-month contracts um, and given 12-month funding, there is that uncertainty, so we do see them um, leave, but we, we don't measure it. Uh, wouldn't that be an important input in trying to understand that workforce capacity side of the ledger, which is an important input itself in, in deciding how you're going to tackle the backlog? Yeah, we've got people on um, in seats um, progressing the, 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 the claims, absolutely. But the actual employment arrangement we have with them is the 12-month employment. So they may go within that 12 months. So you're going to see that um, that turnover of staff when you've got 12 months. So you're just, you're just assuming they're going to turn over at 12 months? Well, they do if we don't have funding. But you don't analyse what the actual turnover amongst the labour hire is? It's, it's For attrition, no, we don't. Our systems don't and, do And that. my question is, wouldn't it be important to understand that attrition so that you were better, you had a better basis for understanding your workforce capacity <laughs> and therefore a better basis for understanding how and by when you might be able to tackle the backlog? Yes, I want less labour hire and more public servants. Okay, but you don't want to do, you don't see any benefit in doing an analysis of the turnover of contracted labour hire staff? I know they turn over every 12 months. Okay. Well, 12 months. So for, for six months of that time, on average, they're 50% less productive than other staff? That's correct. And then well, you only have... I object to that. Um, the, the proposition in the question is incorrect because they're measured at three months where they are 50%. It does not follow that it's at six months or even five months and two days, they're still at 50%. Well, um, I'm happy to recast the question. A little earlier, Ms Cosson, you agreed with me that as a general rule of thumb, given at the midpoint they were 50% less productive, then let's, um, let's assume that on average for that period they're 50% less productive, but I'm not going to hold you to that mm, thank you. as a precise figure. Mm. Um, but it's something in that order. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Yep. Okay, so referring to 50% in that sense only, as a rule of thumb and not holding you to, to a precise figure, in effect for half of the time that you engage the labour hire staff, they're at that significantly reduced level of productivity. That's right, isn't it? That's correct. So wouldn't it follow that it's it would be beneficial to DVA to 
retain the services of a labour hire staff member longer than um, the 12 years, uh, the 12 months for which they're contracted and engage with the labour hire company to ensure as best you can for the continuity of people who've already been contracted to DVA to continue for, say, another 12 months. That would be beneficial for DVA's workforce capacity in claims processing, wouldn't it? There's a couple of things in that. Yes, it would, but I would require the department's funding to be able to give that um, assurance to the labour hire company that I could pay for the staff. Have you been able to achieve continuation of contracts on any material scale in that manner? I rely on the funding yes. to be given to me each year for contract So is the answer no, you no. haven't been able to, I see. Isn't that a waste of um, Commonwealth money in the sense that you're having to continually, in effect, make fresh contracts and train fresh labour hire contracted workforce who are going to be subject to that much lower productivity for half of the time they're contracted and you, you're in effect doing that year on year, whereas it'd be a much more efficient way open to you of trying to continue with the contracts of the contracted labour hire staff you already have? I'll always have a mix in my workforce, which will include labour hire, um, and I um, am on the record as saying that the balance that we had between APS and contracted was not right because of exactly as you're describing. What should the balance be in claims processing? Uh, for a whole um, department's workforce, um, I believe it should be 20, no, maybe no more than 20% labour hire and the rest of the workforce should be based on ongoing and non-ongoing. That's across the whole department. That's what I believe it should yeah, be. Yeah, but, but I'm asking about claims processing yeah, I, where you have this productivity I problem. I agree within claims processing as well. That would be a good mix. Why would it be the same as across the department when you've got this productivity problem for half of the, the term of the contract mm -hmm. and it seems that you've never been able to achieve the continuation of a contract of existing labour hire staff at any material scale? Why wouldn't it follow that you'd try to minimise uh, to a greater, greater degree than 20% the use of labour hire staff in claims processing? For any workforce giving that flexibility, if you if surge or if demand goes down, it gives you that, um, that flexibility with your workforce. So that's why I'd set uh, 20%. What, what, are those productivity issues in effect encountered across the DVA in other areas of the DVA, that is that new, uh, new, new staff are significantly less productive to that level than claims processing, uh, 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 your pardon, are similarly less productive as claims processing staff are. Is, is that what you say? No. Um, Claims process, excuse me, our claims processing staff um, require considerable training to understand the complexity of our legislation in their um, exercising of delegations. And uh, the rest of the, the department, however, has also seen a surge in demand as what we are seeing in the claims processing area. All right, well, I'll move on from there. But it's, it, 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 I'll just have one final go to elicit opinion, your opinion on this. It mm -hmm. seems that the claims processing staff are subject to unique factors which makes them um, significantly less productive during the first six months of their engagement with DVA than staff in other areas would be. Do you agree with that? All staff are required to be trained, but yes, in the claims processing, it's considerable training. And that's because of the complexity of the Correct. task. And we're going to go to that uh, a little later. Um, perhaps it'll be after lunch, but we'll, we'll come to that topic of the complexity of the task mm -hmm. a little later. Now, doesn't that mean that there's um, a greater imperative to use continuing staff, if I can use that expression, whether they be APS staff or contracted labour hire on continuing rolled over contracts if you can achieve that, but you haven't been able to achieve that. Yes. In claims processing by comparison to other areas of the department. Yes. Yet you're saying that the optimal 
um, staff mix of 80, 20, 80 representing APS staff and 20 representing contracted labour hire staff is a uniform optimal ratio across the entire department and you don't make any special allowance for those productivity problems in claims processing. I don't understand why it's a uniform optimal staff mix across the department. Do you have any explanation? Because I need, I need flexibility in the workforce. All right. Um, I want to ask you about the ASL side of the equation. Oh, firstly, I should ask, I, th I think you might have just said that the current level across the department is about one third labour hire contractors to um, two thirds APS staff, is that right? We're nearly at one third, we're a bit above that still. In the oh, you a bit above one third are yeah. labour hire contractors, labor hire, are they? I see. And in claims processing, is, is that also yeah. the current actual ratio? I don't have the exact ratio, but it is higher than what I think it should be. Yes. So it's, a, it's just over a third. It was sitting at, um, a bit higher than that earlier this year. All right, thanks. Earlier now, the financial year, sorry. There have been developments uh, on the ASL cap, which you explained earlier, as mm -hmm. the limit on the number of Australian public service staff you can employ, uh, both across the department and in claims processing in the last two budgets. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's correct. So let's just go to the 2021-2 budget. I don't think we need to go to the portfolio budget statements to do this. Mm. Um, you've said in your statement that in that budget, so May 21, there was allowance for initial 447 um, APS, pardon, APS staff represented by the ASL cap being raised to that extent. Um, and you um, you mention that figure of 447, but you don't say how many of them uh, would be permitted to work in claims processing. How many of those under the increase in the ASL cap, how mm -hmm. many of that increase can work in claims processing within DBA? Okay. So of the 447 we received in the last budget... Um, the, not the last budget, the, oh, sorry, the, the May yeah, 21 yeah, budget. Sorry, I do yep. mean that one. Yep. Thank you. Um, we identified uh, 390.5 that would be assigned, allocated to um, direct delivery in response to the, the claims area. 116 of that 390 um, went to the two divisions that's... Um, are impacted as well by the growth in the, the claims and importantly when uh, veterans lodge a claim. So the remainder, and I'm sorry, my math's not that good, 390.5 minus 116, that difference went into the claims processing area. Uh, 447 minus 116. No, no, no. Um, sorry. Right. So 407. 390.5 four minus 116. Thank you. Got it. Just 274 went into claims processing. Thank you. All right, and how long uh, was that approval of the increase of the ASL cap by 447 carrying with it that, that subset of 274 additional full-time equivalent APS employees in claims processing? How long was that approval for? Um, so we look at ASL over every two years. Um, so we've got the funding uh, with the intent uh, to reduce the claims backlog in that two-year period. Okay. So that was granted in May 21 to begin on the 1st of July 2021. That's correct. And to run until the 30th of June 2023. Correct. So um, you, you mentioned you look at ASL over two years. Is that actually a government... Um, when you say we, who are you talking about? It's, there? Published, talking about... it's published for two years. It's published for two years. So it's, it's a, in effect a central agency's or government or Australian government constraint imposed on DVA that you have that, that rise in ASL for those two years with no guarantees after the two years. Is that a correct reading of what you're saying? 
Just a couple of things. A couple, yep. uh, so some of the um, ASL um, allocated to the Department of that 447 will be continuing programs, that nothing to do with claims. So um, we occasionally get ASL to implement new programs. That might be continuing. But then others, um, we go back and um, depending on what the program is. All right. But it, how long have you got the 274 extra people in claims processing who, are, who, who you can employ, who you can yeah. in, engage as APS employees because of that increase in the ASL cap? How long, how long is that for? It's ongoing. It, it's, it doesn't, um, you mean it? A minute ago, you said you look at it for two published years. Published for two years. It's always published for two years. Okay, so you so I can't um, show you where it's um, published. You can't show me where it's published. It's not. Oh, I see. <laughs> sorry, it's not published. I, I'm not following. I'm sorry, Miss Cosson. What, what do you, I thought you said it was published for two years. Sorry, it is published for two years, but beyond that, it's not published. I see. And when you say published, do you mean the government has? made a decision and recorded a formal decision that that increase of 447 FTE APS employees will apply for two years, but it hasn't made or published any decision after that two years. Is that a correct interpretation of what you're saying? So if I can, though, with the 447, yeah. some of it will be ongoing, some of it will not. For the claims um, allocation, that is ongoing ASL. My point is they don't publish that in our portfolio budget statement. So if you're looking for our ASL in a formal document, it's not published. A minute ago you said it's published for two years on the expectation that the claims backlog yes. would be, and then I think you used the word like prevent, uh, reduced or eliminated within the two years. That's I thought correct. you were saying that the increase in ASL cap was a temporary measure for two years to reduce and prevent, uh, reduce and eliminate the claims backlog. Is that not what you were saying? I, so the ASL is ongoing um, for the claims backlog. We have funding for two years to come back and that's when it would be reassessed if we need more funding or a continuation of that ASL. I see. I see. And then in the current budget, uh, the March 2022 budget for financial year beginning 1st of July 2022, there was a further addition to the ASL cap, is that right? That's correct. And further funding, but in the budget papers, uh, there's um, some of that funding referred to. Is that right? Um, so in the budget papers, uh, there was $22.8 million over the two years for 90 additional ASL over those two years. That has been published. Okay, $22.8 million dollars over two years from the 1st of July that's correct. 2022. That's correct. So the the, the upshot of this uh, and, and with those 90 additional people all um, intended to be working on claims processing or is there a similar division of labour and resources as there was with the uh, the 390.5 people. So it's intended for those additional ASL to be um, allocated to the claims area. Okay. And and a minute ago you said 274 of the 390.5 are going to be working in claims. That's correct. And now you've got approval from 1st July this year for an additional 90, taking the figure to an additional 364 people over the, the level of uh, people who are working in claims or approved to work under the ASL cap in claims at the end of um, 30 June 2021. That's correct. Now, that, the funding for, for those people, as opposed to the ASL cap, the funding for those people is certain for uh, financial year 2021 to mm -hmm. 
and for financial year 2022-3. Correct. But when we get to financial year 2023-4, there's a question mark over whether you would receive funding for the continuation of the 274 people who were originally approved in the May 2021 budget, correct? That's correct. The 90 people will be funded in that financial year. That's correct. But then when we get to the end of 2023-4, there'd be a question mark over the continuation of the funding for those people. Not for the 90. Oh, end of 23-24, sorry. Um, Yes, we've got two years funding, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's correct. There Thank is you. no certainty that Thank you. Do. I think we've sorted it out. Yeah. Now, um, how is the recruiting going? Have you recruited to your current ASL cap? Have you recruited all of those additional allowed and funded 274 Australian public service employees into claims processing? I don't have the exact number, but it's just about there. Um, and the... Um, Combined benefits, um, claims benefits division is already above um, their allocation for um, ASL and labour hire. We allocate both. Okay, now I don't know um, if this is yet available um, to be displayed. Do we have a copy number? Um, you've prepared some statistics on staff numbers uh, and you. Um, it also includes reference to some funding issues around financial supplementation. Um, we're, we're trying to get that uploaded onto the system so we can refer to it through our mm -hmm. electronic court process. Sure. I might come back to that once okay. that's done. It might be after lunch. Um, you, you said you're almost there with the 274. We're getting late now in the financial year 21, be pardon, 22, 3, um, be pardon, 21, 2, <laughs> we're in, in, into um, the fourth quarter of that year and you're mm. still, you're still saying, be pardon, with respect, you're still saying we're nearly there. Yeah. Does that imply that you haven't been able to recruit to that level of 274 previous to this point in the financial year in the fourth quarter? That's correct. And how far behind were you, say, um, in, in, in the midpoint of the financial year at the end of the second quarter, were you well behind the 274? No, we, um, we approached it by uh, looking at the labour hire that we had and for those staff that had been trained, we started to convert them into the non-ongoing. So um, there was a great success with that but we are seeing a bit of instability in the the whole workforce at the moment i do have the numbers there but i just didn't see them quickly enough for you oh okay well i'll please go to them what's what's the current instability what's the turnover rate for this financial year oh sorry i don't have the percentage of turnover but um normal attrition in um the it's sitting at nine percent which is actually lower than the rest of the department for our, our client benefits division um but Noting that division um, is sitting at 912, um, the ASL year to date is 565. This is for the total division, not just claims. I'm sorry, I don't have the breakdown for the actual claims. I see. So claims benefits division it's, includes claims processing, it but it also includes other groups of, of staff That's on correct. other tasks. That's correct. I see. Um, I think we'll, this is probably an opportune moment to go to the funding issues. In overview terms, what is DBA's funding model for its departmental um, outgoings? That is to, to meet the costs the department has to incur in the nature of staff costs and other costs to enable it to administer its programs mm -hmm. compared with the um, 
administration appropriation for mm -hmm. the for the benefits it provides to to veterans. I'm asking about the departmental side Certainly. of the costs. What's the funding model for those costs? So the departmental funding um, appropriation is um, capped. Um, so ASL's cap, but we receive, and in this most recent budget, $430 million um, from the total budget of around $11.9 billion. So $430 million to run uh, the department. And uh, the breakdown of that would include employee benefits, which is about 52% of that at 222 million supplier cost, uh, which is about 15% uh, of that 430. And then of course, we've got leases that we pay for uh, capital funding um, that we are required to to use that 430 million, as I mentioned, it's capped. And that's it. And, an, and where's the cost for paying for labour hire? That's part of the um, employee cost. That's included in yeah. employee benefits, even though they're not actually employees of, you, of yours. That's correct. Okay. And it's capped annually? Yes, it is. And um, what's been your experience since 2017-18 um, of the adequacy of the appropriations to meet those costs? Um, that is departmental costs. We have gone back annually uh, to seek supplementation to the departmental budget. And um, can you just explain for the viewing public what in practice that means? Does that mean the annual appropriation has been inadequate to meet those costs and you've had to go back to the government outside um, the approved annual budgetary appropriation to seek additional costs? We've gone back... Oh, at, additional funding, I should say. Yeah. We've gone back as part of the budget process to seek those additional costs. Right, as part of the budget process. Correct. And um, I don't know, you prepared this helpful sheet for us and we will have it available after lunch, but if you just, um, I'm sorry, it isn't available for you commissioners yet. Uh, we just received that just before court. Um, in the 2017-18 budget um, and following, you received what's called supplementation Funding, is that That's right? correct. And is that the form of um, funding you refer to when you say you, you went back? That's correct. Okay. And you describe the funding model and the difference between administ what you call administered funding and what we've been discussing, which is departmental funding, in your statement at paragraph 65 to 7. Um, can I ask you, when it comes to departmental funding, uh, if a new service is implemented within the department and you need to, or, or an in increased level of services required within the department and you go back and receive supplemental funding for that, does that supplemental funding come off some other aspect of uh, the, the the funding for the department's activities? Is it in effect offset by a reduction somewhere else in the funding for the department? Yes, it is. And is that invariably the case? Uh, usually the case. There are occasions when you are not required to offset. Um, there are other occasions when um, uh, it's offset by another department. All right. Now... I'll just read out the figures that appear in the sheet, and these are largely reflective, but not entirely reflective of a response the department gave to notice to give information number eight, mm -hmm. which is available in the tender list. Now, in 2017-18, there was supplementation funding of $13.5 million. That's correct. In 2018-19, there was supplementation Funding of twelve point one million. That's correct. In twenty nineteen twenty, there was supplementation funding of twenty million. That's correct. I'll just stop there. There are a few more figures to go, but mm -hmm. are you able to say whether or not 
those three instances of supplementation funding were accompanied by offset mm -hmm. offsets reducing the department's funding in other areas no i can't you can't tell you which ones were offset and which ones were sorry all right but it's generally the case that generally there is the offset. case yes and are you if i keep going with the other annual figures is the answer going to be the same that you're not going to be able to recall exactly which ones were offset and which ones weren't that's correct. I, I can't recall which ones were not offset. Okay. Um, but to the best of your recollection and belief, were at least some of them um, accompanied with the requirement to offset? Yes. Right. The witness has now been going for two hours and 20 minutes. Is there a chance she could have a break? Oh, and we need a break for transcript. We, we do. We were due to finish at 12. Uh, it's 12.20, so we'll break for, till one o'clock, I think, if that's convenient. Yes. Okay. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn.
The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Thank you, Mr Gray. Thanks, Commissioner. Ms Cossum, before lunch, one of the things you mentioned was $22.8 million of additional funding in the March 2022 budget in respect of the period uh, commencing 1 July 2022. And this was for or towards the 90 additional ASL, full-time equivalent people who would be able to work in claims processing, correct? Sorry, I'm not sure if your mic's on. It's on and now. Is that correct? That's correct. And you mentioned that that figure was included in the budget papers That's for uh, that budget, the 2022 budget, and... Um, I just want to ask you about whether um, that's an amount of money for funding of those 90 places for the two years from 1st July 2023, uh, 2022, is that right? That's correct, it's funding over two years. And is it a complete uh, amount for the uh, employment and retention of those places, or is it just a portion of the amount that's needed? No, that's that's the amount for the 90 ASL over two years. 90 ASL, 90 ASL, and the 22.8 yep. is over the two years. All right. I just want to ask you about some information that appeared in the media uh, relating to a press conference given by uh, the Honourable Andrew G MP, the Minister for Veterans Affairs and the Minister for Defence Personnel on the 26th of March, 2022. I'll just ask that the transcript of that press conference on the 26th of March uh, now be displayed and you should have it on the screen. And just to anchor that in the transcript, it's EXP 0004 0020407. And in this press conference, the Minister said, and we'll, we'll just go um, please to um, the, pardon, um, I don't have numbering on my pages unfortunately. Um, Now, at the second last page, if I could, well, it's possibly the third last page, it commences, Minister G, the budget process has closed. And so, yes, do you, do you see that? That's page 0412, thank you, operator. Do you see that text at the top of that page, Ms Cosson? The budget process has closed and so almost 23 million will appear officially in the budget. Yes, I can yep. see that. And let's assume that that's a reference to the $22.8 million that appears in the budget papers for the 90 um, extra staff in that's claims cool. processing. Now, the, the minister in this press conference, I'm paraphrasing, but he referred to uh, that amount of $23 million, but he said that um, in addition to that amount, a further amount was going to be provided to him out of, or that is provided to the DBA, press the backlog, uh, up bringing the extra funding up to $96 million. That's great. And could you just explain what the purpose of the additional uh, money bringing that figure up to $96 million is for? So the additional funding to, to bring it up to $96 million, um, is in response to some of the McKinsey initiatives and we're just currently working through um, how that $96 million may be distributed to actually meet the initiatives. Thank you. So if we go to... Uh, the second page of this document, um, at the foot of the page, 
the minister is quoted as having saying, having said, I had requested $96 million to fund the action plan, including more claims processing staff and, and other initiatives like cutting red tape. I was initially told that there was no funding for this vital work. And then when I objected, I was told there would be $22.8 million for 90 temporary staff, but no other funding to deliver the plan. So just pausing there, the action plan the minister's referring to, to the best knowledge and belief, is the set of McKinsey initiatives that I took you to earlier, is it? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. And with that additional funding, bringing the funding up to $96 million, assuming that that funding is provided out of uh, a fund I believe is called the Contingency Reserve. That's correct. Are you satisfied that DVA will have sufficient funding to implement the McKinsey initiatives or are you still waiting on um, government approval in respect of some of them as you indicated before lunch? So with the full $96 million, uh, I'm confident it will actually implement a lot of those 11 initiatives, but not all. Okay. Thank you. So look, just, just to um, sum up, you, you referred before lunch to – thank you, we can put that document away, please, operator. We referred before lunch to some um, impacts that had already – occurred and you'd already noted in your evidence, which in effect undermined assumptions on which McKinsey had based its forecast or prediction of elimination of the backlog by the end of 2023. And, um, in, in a, and they included um, the late commencement of some of the initiatives within uh, DVA and an increase in what we might call demand, that is, growth in new claims beyond that which had been anticipated at the time that McKinsey did its work, correct? That's correct. And since then, we've identified other matters that might undermine um, including uh, the uh, delay, if I could put it that way, in recruiting within DVA up to the full ASL cap uh, permitted in this financial year, correct? That's correct. And um, government uh, consideration is still pending on some of the initiatives, although we haven't identified exactly which ones, and there may not be funding for all of the initiatives even in the most recent March 2022 budget, correct? That's correct. And there's also an issue that you referred to as, uh, I think, workforce instability mm -hmm. in the area and that um, might involve turnover of cl in, in claims staff. Is that also in, impacting on DVA's ability to, in effect, meet the assumptions on which McKinsey based its forecast? That's correct. So as a result of all of those impacts and given the fact that some of the inputs into the forecast were stated by McKinsey to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. It's now the case, isn't it, that the forecast of reduction of the backlog is bound to be significantly delayed. I think you said mm -hmm. sometime into early um, 2024. Is early 2024 really realistic or is it going to be longer than that? It's a best estimate that I can make. Um, and at this stage, we are hoping it will be early 2024. Can I refer to the increase that you have of your ASL cap at the moment in this financial mm -hmm. year, and it's going to be even more substantial in the next financial year, but then there are question marks after that, yes. as you discussed before lunch. Can I refer to that as a surge in your claims processing workforce? Is that an appropriate expression? It's a good expression, yes. There's no guarantee, is there, that the surge will still be in place under any current decisions for funding that have already been made by government um, at the time or over the time frame needed to reduce and then eliminate the backlog on the basis of the McKinsey uh, forecast, is there? I'm sorry, not quite understanding the question. Well, the, the surge is in place at the moment. Yes. And to the end of this financial year in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. 
And in the next financial year for 12 months, the surge will still be in place, but there's no guarantee that the surge will continue after the 30th of June, 2023, on the basis of any decisions for funding that have already been made by government is there. You'll have to go back to government to seek other decisions for funding. That's great. Yep. Thank you. And what I'm, the point I'm just trying to elicit is mid-2023, when you have to go back to government, will actually be a critical um, point in time to address to, and to continue to address the backlog, won't it? Because on the basis of the uh, impact on the assumptions that we just discussed, it's likely that the McKinsey initiatives are going to have to continue to be implemented um, and the backlog will have to be... Uh, have to continue to be addressed for many, many months after mid-2023. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Yeah. I just want to put some propositions to you now, and these are propositions that Council Assisting, in effect, currently has in mind inviting the Commissioners to consider when it comes time for them to um, analyse all of this material, including the evidence you've given today. Mm -hmm on the matters of funding, staffing and the backlog in claims processing. And I'm putting these propositions to you to see whether you agree with them. And if you're able to briefly respond to them, um, indicating whether you agree or not, or if there's some brief qualifying matter that you'd wish to raise, uh, please do so. Okay. Because DVA does not have a model to forecast demand, DVA was unprepared to deal with the increase in claims that began to occur from about 2018. Do you agree? Yes. DVA's annual departmental appropriation was inadequate for DVA to perform its claims processing function in each and every year from financial year 2017-18 to the most recent um, concluded financial year, 2020-21. Do you agree? Yes, I do. In 2017-18, and from about 2017-18, uh, DVA, through at least its senior executive officers, must have known and been aware that DVA's claims processing was not appropriately resourced to meet increasing demand or numbers in claims. Do you agree? Yes, I do. This problem, the problem we just referred to in the previous question of claims processing capacity not being appropriate to meet increasing numbers of claims, persisted and compounded in the years that followed financial year 2017-18. I agree. You agree? Uh, next question. Starting in 2017-18, that is financial year 2017-18, DVA received substantial annual supplementation funding of between that range of $12 million to $23 million each year through to the most recent financial, most recently concluded financial year, correct? That's correct. Over all that period, there have been ASL caps on the number of full-time equivalent APS employees whom DVA can employ, including in claims processing. Is that right? That's correct. Are the ASL caps specific to the various work areas and functions within DVA or, or is it simply global and it's up to you to decide? on the allocation of ASL to particular work areas and functions? It's up to me to decide the allocation of ASL to the different work areas. All right. But in effect, when you've described the ASL allocated to claims processing in your evidence today, you've felt constrained, have you, by all of the other competing requirements that uh, face DVA to allow only the relevant portions or numbers of ASL cap that we've been discussing to be allocated to claims processing. Is that correct? Not quite. Um, so 
I have the department has an ASL cap, and then I have a look at as we've just described the uh, the demands on the different business areas to look at the allocation of that ASL. When we go back to seek supplementation, um, it can be um, supplementation as in the recent budget for claims processing, for example, the 90 um, for claims processing. So that is for the claims processing Thank you. team. So in some respects, you have discretion. Yes. In, in effect, for a base uh, amount of ASL, but then if you seek special funding, you may be tied to using that ASL for only the purposes for which the funding was sought. That's great. Thank you. Next question. Because of the ASL caps on the levels of APS employees whom DVA can employ, including in claims processing, the staffing of the claims processing area has been dependent on obtaining contracted labour hire workforce. That's correct. There are disadvantages to having a proportion of claims processing in excess of 20% labour hire uh, to uh, APS employment, including on productivity and higher cost and turnover grounds, correct? That's correct. The ratio of labour hire in claims processing, that is the ratio of labour hire to APS employment in claims processing, was over, somewhat over, 50% in 2019, 20 and 2020, 21. Do you know that? I don't recall it being over 50%, but it was certainly sitting around the 50%. All right. And you mentioned earlier that in your view, at a little over a third, it still remains inappropriately high. Correct. Next question. Inadequate staffing levels and the high ratio of labour hire to APS staff have materially contributed to the accrual of the backlog, correct? Yes, correct. Next point. In all these circumstances, the backlog has arisen from a combination of the absence of a forecasting model, the DVA funding model, inadequate annual appropriations, and the application of ASL caps. Do you agree? Yes, I do. Next, the solution proposed by DVA and McKinsey, consisting of the 11 McKinsey initiatives, and the forecast of by when it will be able to reduce the current backlog in claims processing is highly optimistic and relies on assumptions that are unlikely to be met, at least in the time frame assumed by McKinsey, correct? That's correct. Ms Cosson, in uh, March, I believe it was the 9th of March, there was an announcement by officials of the government of a very material increase in the personnel of the ADF and, and in the personnel of defence more broadly, but I'll focus on the ADF because the members of the ADF are the people who become potential DVA clients, aren't they? That's correct. And I'll just um, ask for one of the press releases to be displayed. The press release of the 9th of March 2022 is EXP 0004 0020. 0161, but you're familiar yes, with the announcement I'm referring to? Yes, I am. And this was an announcement of something in the order of an increase in 30% of personnel? Yes. To a, certain, um, to a certain point of time in 2040? I'm aware of that, yes. Yeah. Now, I just want to ask you about how you came to uh, know of this proposal for that very material increase in the size of the ADF. When did you first hear about that? Um, I can't recall exactly when. It was certainly before the media announcement um, where Defence uh, came and briefed my senior executive team on um, what was to occur. So that was... I, I, sorry, I can't remember the actual date. Okay. And... Do you, do you recall roughly how long before the announcement it was? Oh, it was several months, 
several months before the announcement. Right. And in, in your statement, um, at paragraph 193, we can go to it um, yes. if, if you need to. It's no, that's fine. Page 38. You were, you were asked a question at the top of the page, was DVA consulted about its capacity to cope with the increase? Mm -hmm on top of the measures that may be required to reduce its current backlog in claims processing. And at paragraph 193, you said DVA was not consulted about its capacity to cope with the planned increases to the size of the ADF. That's correct. All right. So you, you were in effect, you were briefed yes. that it was going to occur, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I'll ask the question. I don't know. Um, if I'll be permitted to, but did you raise capacity concerns about the increase well, during I'm, the course of the discussion? I'm going to have to object because I don't know who the discussion is with and there might be a potential PII claim here. Do you want to clarify that? Yeah. Who was the discussion with? Uh, well, that's the other problem. I'm going to have to object to that because I actually don't know because I didn't know this was coming, so I don't have instructions and I would have to get the instructions to avoid the witness. Uh, it's trained into an area she shouldn't be in breach. All right. So, look, I'll leave it at that at that point. Um, although I do note the topic of the announcement of the increase in the ADF and consultation was the subject of a question that was posed in a notice to the witness. And there is material on this in the statement, but at any rate, my well, friends, I accept in that. But if you're going to make the criticism, you need to look at the drafting of the question and the answer, and it's not suggested in there who discussions were or were not had with. Well, <laughs> purpose of oral examination, one would think, is to ask questions about things that are um, provided in writing and not to simply to require the repetition of things that are provided in writing, but I'll move on. Well, I accept that, but it's not I'm moving on, Mr. Can I Mr. Ford, I'm not you, pressing the question. I know you're not pressing it, but can I just inquire whether, for example, the consultations were with other public servants in the Defence Department, you'd have any objection? I may or I may not, because I don't know on what basis and whether what the information and how it was being conveyed where it came from, what it was, and whether that's cabinet in confidence, and I'm simply not in a position to meet it. Okay. Um, but doing your best, it was some months before the announcement in March this year that you had this discussion. Yes, definitely. And was it just the one occasion you had the discussion? No, there were a couple of occasions that we had the discussion. All right. Now. I'll move to another topic. Well, before, before I do, what's going to be um, the nature of the impact on DVA when that increase in the ADF begins to occur, which I, I imagine is imminent? Um, two questions there. Do you know when the increase in the ADF is going to begin to occur? I recall the announcement said by 2040. Um, I think that's when it's going to be complete. Complete. So I, um, I don't know when they're actually commencing, but certainly we're undertaking the planning now to look at the impact on our workforce, right. um, particularly our workforce that is on our, the uh, defence bases, particularly veteran support officers. Um. Do you know when you'll be in a position to um, understand what the impact of the increase will be on your, that is, DVA's ability to address the backlog and then reach a sustainable point where it is meeting its processing targets? So we are doing that strategic planning at the moment to understand what we need to be putting in place because I believe there are, in my opinion, there's a few things that we should be doing to prepare for that given what we've experienced uh, with the backlog over recent years. Do you know what staffing level and staffing mix you're going to need once you have 
let's hope you have eliminated the backlog. So let's assume that might be sometime into 2024. Uh, I'm not going to hold you to any particular prediction, although you did indicate early 2024, a little earlier. Are you still adhering to your estimate of early 2024 for elimination of the backlog? Yes. All right. Well, let's say early 2024. Do you know what level of staffing and what staffing mix you're going to need after that point in time? Not at this stage, no. If we do have a number of the initiatives implemented, it may be um, that the claims processing is quicker than what it currently is. So if nothing else happens, um, we'd look at one scenario, but if we do get some of the initiatives up, then it'll be a different scenario. I want to ask you about a different topic now, and it's some points you make about the Australian veteran support system. And you address this in your statement at paragraphs 210 to 214. And just giving you a potted summary, I think you know better than I do what you said in your statement. But just to paraphrase, you, you, you've said the system has evolved in such a way that it's considered not fit for contemporary needs of veterans. That's in the middle of paragraph 210. You remember mm -hmm. writing that? Yes. And firstly, you say it's considered not fit. Do you consider it not fit for the contemporary veterans? I'm, uh, I do consider it is not fit. Correct. Thank you. And you, you, you refer to uh, there having been incremental, continual and incremental changes that have not produced intended outcomes. Are you saying here in a nutshell that there hasn't been a systematic approach to the design of the veteran support system, and rather it's the product of a number of incremental developments over time? That is what I'm saying. Okay. Now, what are the key changes, if you can give an overview, the key changes Oh, look, look, I won't ask that. Um, do, do, I don't think we have time. Can I just ask you this? Do you see DVA's role in that system as um, a role encompassing responsibility for the entire system or do you see DVA's role as, in effect, an important player in the system but not having an overall system-wide responsibility? I see DVA as having a, a lead role in that oversight of the whole system. All right. And that group, in you, decide, you describe the restructure of the department elsewhere in your statement and yes. you refer to the separation of the service functions mm -hmm. from the policy functions. And would you say that policy function group in DVA would, would assume that role under your vision for the system? Is that yes. Right? Yes, I do. All right. And... Are you able, just in a brief overview, if it's possible, to describe how you would see DVA having that coordinating role for the system? What would be the key elements of, of what would have to change in order for DVA to have an effective um, system coordination role over and above what it already does? So I don't see DVA as the only... Um part of that system. So I see DVA would be responsible for um, designing the policy as they do now and program and oversight and measure and evaluation, key role for any element of the system that's delivering to veterans and families. Uh, including using general uh, services that are available to the community and what, making sure that they're available to veterans yeah, so we do a lot of that now where we engage with other agencies, particularly in the health system, uh, because we, we're not actually the deliverer of most of the services. We're a purchaser of that. And I think there is certainly more DVA could do in that system um, to ensure veterans are accessing the support and services to which they're um, eligible to receive. At the moment, a lot of veterans um, and, and families are not aware of uh, what support and services they can receive. And I think this is something we're going to have to come back to later in the, in the inquiry in a lot more detail. But is it the case, for example, that the health system or, say, the correction system, the various community services, don't contact DVA 
when there is a veteran who is using their services and about whom there might be concerns or, or risks. That might happen on occasion, but it's, there's no systematic way for that to happen. Is that right? That's correct. Now, earlier in your statement, jumping right back to the front, you refer to um, that point we touched upon when I was asking you questions about the mission statement and mm -hmm. whether DVA is really resourced and able to support all veterans or it's in effect relying on a um, react, more reactive model where the veteran has to come forward to the DVA now and with, in effect, the exception of the correspondence that occurs through uh, early engagement, which has been in place since 2016, it's mm -hmm. in effect a reactive model, isn't it, where the veteran yes. has to come forward? That's correct. Now, you say in paragraph 20, you're of the opinion that the DVA should know all veterans. Yes. And then you refer to the importance of uh, improving the information interface with defence in that regard and other things. So I don't think we'll have time to delve too deeply into that. Again, these are topics that are going to have to come back to later mm. in the inquiry, in the inquiry, and they're probably, um, although they're very important, they're probably not urgent in the in the sense required by the terms of reference for the interim report. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to come back to those. I do want to ask you about something you just mentioned in passing, I recall, before lunch, veteran support officers. Yes. Uh, you do say, we've heard um, in a panel earlier in this hearing there are about 40 of them, you do say you'd like that program to be... Um, bigger in effect, for there to be a greater presence across more ADF bases or at least more frequently at the ADF bases. What sort of a level does that veteran support officer resource need to be at to be satisfactory in your view? Uh, so at the moment we're present on about 56 of our defence bases and we've got, as you um, heard in the evidence, around 40. And For, I So 40 personnel? Um, so they're not always at 56 bases, clearly. They're part-time at some bases and That's so forth. That's correct. Yes. Um, I, I don't have a, a number, but I would like to expand that veteran support office uh, capability and professionalise it within the department. Do you aim for any particular ratio of veteran support officers to ADF personnel at a given location? No, I've not done that. Do you have a vision that the veteran support officers would actually be in sufficient numbers to be able to cultivate person-to-person person -person relationships rather than, in effect, present workshops? Um, uh, they do have a person-to-person -person relationship now. We're on the basis when um, they take appointments and they meet with uh, serving members and particularly those that are transitioning. So they do have both. They present and they educate, but they have the person-to-person -to -person too. How effective is the person-to-person element of the function able to be given that resourcing issue? I think it's very effective at the moment. It, it could grow. Okay. Do you, from increasing the numbers, do you have any other ideas about how that uh, VSO, Veteran Support Officer Network, should look? Would there be other changes you'd make to it to augment it or improve it? Uh, just um, just investing in their training as well and uh, we've, we undertake what's called um, understanding the veteran experience with our DBA staff so that they understand what it is to serve in the, the Defence Force. So using those VSOs to educate other parts of the department I think would be um, a great way forward. All right. I'm going to go now to legislative reform and this, this is really a topic we, that is the Royal Commission, raised with you in your notice to give a statement by reference to three key recommendations of the Productivity Commission in mid-2019. And they were, as you recall, and you've addressed them in your statement, they were, in effect, key pillars of the recommendations the Productivity Commission had to uh, harmonise the legislation that we spoke about briefly before, mm -hmm. VEA, Merca and Durka. Mm -hmm. And I um, I uh, read into the transcript what the full names of those acts were at the time, but we'll just stick with the acronyms now. 
And recommendation 8.1, I don't think we need to display these. Uh, we can save a bit of time. You obviously recall them, I think, Ms. Cosson. Recommendation 8.1 was for the harmonisation of uh, initial liability processes. Um, 13.1, or initial liability requirements as well, not just processes. 13.1 uh, was for the harmonisation of the Merca and the Durka and 19, um, I beg your pardon, I think it was, um, Pardon me. Oh, and 19.1 is for a two scheme framework going forward whereby Veteran Entitlement Act uh, claimants and benefit holders would continue to uh, receive their benefits under the Veterans Entitlements Act. Mm -hmm. um, and the harmonised Merca and Durka cohort of claimants would operate under a different scheme, a harmonised piece of legislation, and over time that second part of the scheme, the merca Durka cohort, would just, just through the natural course of people's lives and over time, the VEA component would become smaller and the merca and Durka component would in, it, in the end become um, the sole cohort uh, to, to which DVA is providing benefits through um, the rehabilitation and compensation legislation for veterans. Mm -hmm. So with those broad pillars, you were asked some questions about DVA's position on those reforms and you said DVA supports the intent of those reforms, correct? That's correct. And I just want to ask, has... DVA, in the time since June 2019 when these recommendations were made through to the present day in August 22, I'll be pardon, in April 22, produced a better set of proposals or recommendations for legislative reform than the recommendations contained in the Productivity Commission report? In your say, opinion? I wouldn't say it's a better set. It's... Um, nuanced set um, based on what options there may be to consider. Um, we've had more experience, well, not me, a lot of um, people that understand the acts better than I have looked at, well, what does that mean? What are the consequences? And just refined what those recommendations might look like. And has that set of proposals that's more nuanced and refined actually been produced? Does it exist as a document or a set of documents? Uh, it sets in a uh, it's set in a range of um, documents that we've put forward to ESORT, for example, where we had a workshop with them where we were testing some options and um, uh, to um, the executive where we've had a look at some opportunities with some of the recommendations on what that might look like. Okay. And so there, there are two sets of documents you're referring to there, some forwarded to ESORT. And have they been made available to all ESORT members? If they were part of the workshops, then yes, they would have been. All right. And what's there's a workshop within ESORT on legislative reform. That's correct. And you're talking about that workshop? Yes, that's correct. And has that specifically been looking at nuanced and refined versions of the amendments to the legislation along the lines of the recommendations proposed by the Productivity Commission? It's certainly looking at the recommendations of the Productivity Commission to get their feedback and thoughts on what we would need to consider um, regarding their consequences or if there is an alternative. Okay. And do you know roughly... Um, I'll, just, I'll just ask another question. Have you been on that workshop? I know you're on the, um, mm -hmm. the, the that, broader, uh, that broader body because you chair it, mm -hmm. but... This workshop, is this in effect a committee of the broader body? There was a subset of the ESORT that did workshop. I didn't participate in the actual workshop. Okay. But representatives of DVA attended, did they? That's great. And 
roughly how many of those have been um, held since June 2019 to the present day that have focused on these issues, that is, in developing nuanced and detailed versions of uh, legislative reforms consistent with the intent of the Productivity Commission recommendations? I don't have a number, but I know there have been several in the department as well, having workshops across the different areas of the department, but there was the one with ESORT. Okay, oh, right. There's one. All right. Um, there have been several internal within DVA, but just one with ESORT. Is that what you're saying? Pretty sure it's just the one with ESORT, yes. Okay. And was when was that? Um, I think it's in the um, the documents, December 2020. You don't? I recall you, seeing it on the tender list. I thought I saw the, the workshop there or in the ESORT meeting pack. I think it was December 2020. Okay. Um, well, I'll just... Uh, I, I'm just not sure about this. I, I, I think we need to clarify this, Ms. Coss, and I'm just going to ask you, um, just give me a moment. Mm -hmm. You deal with this in paragraphs 44 to 64 of your statement. We did ask you some questions about what progress has been made on, in effect, consult, consultation and thinking on legislative reform. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you do mention a workshop, but I thought you described it as an internal one. So there has been an ESORT workshop, and I'm sorry I don't have the, the dates in front of me, yeah. but we certainly have had internal workshops. Uh, I see. Perhaps you're referring to what is described at paragraph 50 of your statement on page 11. Perhaps, operator, if you could bring that up. You say there, in December 2020, feedback from ex-service organisation roundtable members on specific recommendations in the PC report, Productivity Commission report. That's correct. And the views obtained from this process continue to inform work currently underway. Is that that's, what you're referring to? That's what I'm referring to, yes. And when you say you sought feedback, was that in a meeting or was that simply a documentary process? It was in a meeting and then they, the ESORT formed a subgroup um, to work through it to give us feedback. I see. So um, we have the Productivity Commission report in June 2019. You seek feedback from the ESORT members on specific recommendations in December 2020, about a year and a half later. Yes. Why the delay? No reason um, other than just preparing to have the discussions and talking about it within the department. The complexity of the legislation is a urgent and important matter, isn't it? Yes. And I think I should raise this with you just, just for the record. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the factors that you adverted to during um, your evidence about claims processing as adding to the adding to the, the factors that uh, make it difficult for staff to be fully productive for some time. It takes about six months to train them up to the point where they're fully productive. And that's partly because of the complexity of the legislation. Is that right? That's correct. And it, do you believe that it may be driving um, the backlog, that is contributing to the backlog in other ways than simply through the complexity faced by staff, for example, because of multiple claims being made? Yes. Yes. And we know that there's that connection between claims processing or at least you acknowledged in your earlier evidence, connection between claims processing mm -hmm. delays and potential impact on mental health mm -hmm. and, it, and you acknowledged it could be a risk of suicidality. So in all those circumstances, it is an urgent matter to get on with this, isn't it? Yes, and we agree. Then in paragraph 51, Ms. Cosson, the next step you mention is, this is under, I should have said, this is under the question or heading, internal and external steps that have been taken by DVA so far to consider and address the recommendations. The next step you mention is in May 2021, 
in the budget. The government announced that a legislation reform roadmap will be developed with broad consultation involving the veteran community. And without asking you to reveal any cabinet deliberations or anything like that, to the extent that you're able to answer, why the delay between the step you mentioned at the end of at the end of 2020 of seeking feedback from ESORT and that decision in the May 21 budget, you know, almost a year and a half later. Why that delay? I object if that's inviting the witness to comment on what government has or has not done in a period of time. If, if he wants to ask if there's a delay within DVA itself, that's a separate concept. I'm happy to limit the question to whether, to the best of your knowledge and belief, any element of that fraction of time is attributable to DVA. Yes. What, to that extent, was there, was there a contribution by DVA to that period of delay? Yes, there would have been in um, 2020. And why, why is that? Uh, we did have COVID um, in 2020 and uh, that had a huge impact on the department. But also any change to the legislation is really complex um, and we were always trying to find ways that we could um, take that forward. In the, in the nuance and further refinement that, that you say has been um, provided between in, in various documents between ESORT and the department, um, is there anything that is actually inconsistent with those three recommendations that I mentioned at the start, three key recommendations of the Productivity Commission, or are you talking about uh, proposals that are in effect filling in detail but consistently with those major recommendations? Do you know? Yes. Um ESORT uh, came to the discussions, many of them, uh, believing we should have one act, not two. So that was uh, part of the workshop. Uh, similarly, the Productivity Commission uh, underpinning their recommendation was the removal of the service differential and uh, war, non-warlike um, peacetime service. That was contentious. So there were some elements you needed to tease out in those recommendations of which ESORT um, and, and the department um, were working through to understand how you could take some of those recommendations forward, but the intent of them is we agree. The intent, the, the intent of them you, DVA, agree with, but there are some elements of ESORT who disagree with removing the service differential between Merca and Durka, making it difficult to harmonise Merca and Durka. Is that right? Uh, no, not quite. Um, so the service differential applies across um, VEA and MRCA where you have warlike and non-warlike service. That's contentious to remove it and uh, make that equal. The other, um, the harmonisation of DERCA and MRCA, there will be um, losers, winners or losers um, with that harmonisation because they are so different. And... When you say there will be losers, yes. do you mean that uh, there are people who uh, wouldn't obtain the entitlements they would under the current legislation if the Productivity Commission recommendations are implemented? That's correct. And who are they? Who are they that will lose entitlements? Yeah. It, it varies. It, um, it would vary. It would be, uh, for example, someone under DERCA is assessed by condition if you were to align that with Merca, where you're assessed at a whole person, those that can keep coming back and claiming under Durka would lose. Uh, if you were to align the Merca with the Durka, where you do it by condition, um, some of them might lose as well. So, but, Well, okay, I understand what you're saying, I think. You're not saying that somebody who has a, an already recognised condition and a decided claim would be a loser. They get, no, they, I'm not saying that. No. You're just saying that there's a counterfactual exercise involved and from a certain point in time, people who develop a particular condition, if the prior state of the legislation had continued, they might have got a better outcome. 
and they might end up with a slightly lesser outcome under the harmonised legislation. Is that all you're saying? That's what I'm saying. So they're losers in a hypothetical sense, provided you, you go through that counterfactual exercise. If you grandfather everyone, yeah. but that's not what the Productivity Commission no. was saying. And just on that point, um, those individuals are, can't be identified now because we're talking about hypothetical or counterfactual and factual developments in the future, aren't we? We're not saying, you're not saying you know that there is an identified individual who falls into that category now. Um, I am saying there are a number of individuals who would have eligibility under DERCA and continue to have eligibility under DERCA in its current form. If you were to harmonise with MRCA, they would lose that eligibility. So there are existing veterans now who would lose that eligibility if you were to do the full harmonisation. There might be other benefits of... Of Merck. So Dirk is more like a, um, a general community workers' compensation style form of compensation, correct? That's correct. And Merca is a special ADF-specific um, form of compensation for, in effect, uh, serving ADF members and ex-serving ADF members. Colloquially, we could use the expression veterans. Is that right? That's right. And there are benefits to Merca over over and above Durka. Yes. And but you're pointing to a possibility that there might be certain circumstances in which there are benefits under Durka that aren't available under Merca. Correct. I see. Isn't it in the nature of harmonization that there has to be compromises made of that kind? And if overall the cohort under Merca is better off, if you harmonize in the direction of Merca, that would be a fair and reasonable philosophy to bring to the harmonisation exercise? So my view yep. is uh, you should harmonise DERCA into MRCA because MRCA was established in 2004 for the future, yep. um, for veterans then and veterans in the future. Um, but there will be um, views in the community that will not support my opinion. Nevertheless, these are points of detail and no doubt there needs to be detail filled in under those mm. three broad pillars of the Productivity Commission's recommendations. But in your view, it, it should be possible to reach reasonable solutions to, to all of those harmonisation issues, shouldn't it? They okay. may not, be, they may not um, yeah. be agreed to by everybody, but they will be reasonable solutions and compromises, won't they? I believe you could, you could do that, yes. Thank you. Now, I want to, um, I think, move to a different topic. But just pardon me while we just review our points and Sorry, I can't move to the next topic just yet. Um, I think I mentioned a minute ago uh, an aspect of the decision making of the government in the May 21 budget involving the announcement of a legislation reform roadmap to be developed. I just want to ask you about that roadmap. Um, Productivity Commission report came down in uh, June. 2019, there was an interim government response in about October of uh, that year. A big pardon, October 2020. Is that right? That's correct. But that interim government response didn't engage in detail with the legislative reform recommendations that we've been discussing. It in effect, and I'm paraphrasing, but uh, tell me if you recall anything different, it in effect said these matters are under consideration by government and progressing and so forth. That's correct. That's correct, isn't it? And then um, it wasn't until some months later in the May 21 budget that there was a position given by government in response to those legislative reform recommendations and that position for the first time in, uh, in the updated government response to the Productivity Commission's recommendations in May 21 was that there would be a legislation reform roadmap developed in consultation with uh, veteran community. 
That's correct. Right. I want to ask you about the roadmap. Um, we asked you, that is the Royal Commission asked you questions by notice about the roadmap and the, some of these questions you've reproduced in your statement. At the top of page 12, there's a question about why is the legislative reform roadmap still in the early stages of development and I will ask you that. But firstly, what exactly is the roadmap? And I'll just flesh that out a bit for you. For example, is it intended to be in effect just a set of uh, an articulation of a set of steps that should be taken by by particular times, because that's one possible meaning for a roadmap. Or is it something more detailed? Is it intended to be some sort of guidance as to the filling out of that detail consistently, consistently with the key Productivity Commission reports on legislative reform, but recognising that um, detail needs to be filled out and, and nuances need to be developed and there need to be compromises to achieve harmonisations. That's another possibility. Or is it something even broader than that that is, in effect, a blank slate for a roadmap to be developed that might produce legislation that doesn't, in fact, adhere to the recommendations of the Productivity, productivity Commission? And there are only three possibilities. I don't mean to constrain you, but that's that's what I mean by the question. Mm. So um, a roadmap to me is going to take you to your destination um, and outline how you get there. If I take the Productivity Commission and its recommendations to move to the two schemes and you would need to therefore understand how and when you would harmonise different elements of those three acts and that would be a stepped approach to going where you're going. When there's still some debate regarding whether it should be a single act, that's a different roadmap. So the roadmap um, needs to be taking us to where it's agreed that we should be going with that legislation reform. Okay. I better ask um, the operator to just display the, um, the response, that is the updated response that contains these words, it's document PCO, I pardon, PCO quadruple zero, triple zero one, one zero three zero, and we'll just have a look at what we're talking about. The thing is, it isn't view at least, whether the, whether the government is saying that it agrees with the intent of the recommendation and it's in effect delegating the responsibility to uh, establish a plan to get the work done to get to the destination, which would be amending legislation, mm -hmm. or whether it's saying something broader and I don't know whether you're able to clarify what the government intention is based on any, anything else you might know. Let's just take recommendation 8.1, the first of those key recommendations. That's on page five, please, operator, 1034. And this is the May 2021 updated government response to the Productivity Commission report. And we take the first row REC 8.1 harmonised the initial liability process. Uh, the, the middle column, Miss Cosson, was the uh, reference back to what the interim response had been. So we can ignore that for present purposes. Mm -hmm. The, the right-hand column, I think I might have said row again, the middle column mm -hmm. was pending further consideration, but that is back in October uh, 2020. That's out of date. As at May 21, the government response is in the right-hand column. The recommendation will now be subject to a legislative reform roadmap that will be developed. The legislative reform will be carefully considered and require broad consultation with the veteran community. So that's what I was paraphrasing earlier. It doesn't say, does it, that the recommendation is 
accepted in principle and the roadmap is intended to be the pathway to the destination of implementing it. But is that how you understand the recommendation? That's correct. Right. And do you base that on anything that you're allowed to refer to now? Any discussions that you've had with anybody that demonstrate that that's the correct reading of that uh, response? I have to object to that with the word any, anybody in it because the potential list of people she could have discussed it with would be something she could not give evidence about. Uh, it, putting aside discussions with a minister, can I ask that question, Mr Ford? It, it's not necessarily limited to a minister, though. All right, I won't press the question. In any event... Just for my, for my sake, how far do you say it goes? It depends on who the person you're discussing it with and what... And whether it's for submission to Cabinet, for example. If someone's yeah. telling you about what it is is going to Cabinet or being discussed, then obviously the witness can't talk about it. Or has been, sorry, quite correct. Well, I, I need to get on with the examination, so for that reason, if nothing else... I'd, please, I, I nobody understand. should... I yeah. understand. I'm just uh, trying to work, work out the parameters of the dispute. Yeah. Um... Let's just leave it on this basis, and I think I'm allowed to ask this. Uh, in your own mind, you have a proper basis for the view you've given that the reading of, of, of that response that we just read out a few minutes ago is to be understood as agreement in principle by government with the recommendation, um, and the roadmap is the plan to get to the point where that legislation can be put before parliament. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Right, now we can go to the next topic, which is lifetime wellbeing. You addressed this topic, Ms Cosson, at paragraphs 152 to 159 of your statement. Thank you. And there's an element... We're not going to give independent uh, consideration to another topic that was raised for, your, um, for you to respond to, which was the Productivity Commission's recommendation heavy on defence, mm -hmm. representing, in effect, all of the uh, compensation and rehabilitation costs entailed over the lifetime of a, of a member or former serving member of the ADF, in effect being um, calculated on actuarial principles mm -hmm. and levied on uh, defence on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will sneak in a reference to that um, in the course of, of asking you about lifetime wellbeing. Okay. What do you understand by the notion of lifetime wellbeing? And um, you, you've referred to the DVA concept of wellbeing and the seven domains. Is, is, is your notion of lifetime wellbeing materially different from from that concept of that seven domain uh, um, idea of well-being, or or is it the same? It's the same. Should, should we just display that? Let's go to the corporate plan at STU stop double zero double zero stop triple zero two stop seven five three one. This is already Exhibit twenty two six point twenty. That's the current, that's the most recent that's, corporate plan? Yes, it is. Yep. And we'll go to page four, 7536. And... I was referring to the seven domains of well-being. Is that diagram a representation of those seven domains that we were yes, just yes referring it is. to? Yes. So when when you take a lifetime perspective of the well-being of the ADF member, how does that account for things like latent injury or latent psychological harm in DBA's view? 
So there is no time limit on when you can um, come to DVA to get support, lodge a claim or um, seek services. That can happen any time after your service. The, yeah, thanks. So you, you, let's just spend a minute on latent, latent injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean by that and what I understand <laughs> you to be acknowledging in responding to the question is something happens at an early point in time, mm -hmm. but it isn't apparent that there... It may not even be apparent that there is any injury at all. The effects of whatever happened at the early point in time might not be apparent as an injury until a much later point in time, correct? That's correct. And that might lead to impairment. It might lead to um, entitlements under the legislation that DVA administers to um, to a disability pension if it's if it's VA or to mm -hmm. um, a lump sum or a pension amount paid um, amounts paid as a pension under the other legislation. That's correct. And the purport of what the Productivity Commission thought might address the issue in an appropriate manner uh, would be to focus defence's attention on the lifetime costs, the costs across the, the whole lifespan of members of the ADF of things that happen to them while they're in defence and to ensure that there's a price, what's, what can be described as a price signal, that is a real cost that defence bears um, if something happens in service that later incurs compensation and rehabilitation costs, correct? That's correct. Now, you've said in your statement that Data sharing is an appropriate way of ensuring that, in effect, the same outcomes are reached that the Productivity Commission intended to reach through the levying of a levy on act of that kind. How, how would data sharing achieve that? So the, um, the Productivity Commission, in um, their view about the price signal, was that defence needed to be aware of the injuries incurred during their training or during military operations. And so what we've suggested, rather than applying, a, um, as you pointed out, a, a premium through actuarial assessments that we share and tell them, this is what we're seeing with patterns of claiming. This is where we're seeing um, injuries incurred after they've left so that they can um, look to modify their training right. or their so activities. It, and in effect, you're hopeful that they'll take that on board in modifying their activities and the way they do, uh, the way they conduct um, training and the influence they have on service life for members of the ADF. But there isn't an incentive of the, of the power of a price signal on defence to do so. Would you agree with that? I agree with that statement. Just going back to the seven domains of wellbeing, we're not only talking about injury here, we're talking about a more positive concept than that, aren't we? Absolutely. How do you know when a veteran or anybody has attained a satisfactory level of wellbeing in those domains and how do you know when they haven't and when some support is needed? Is, is there any analysis that DVA has done or is doing to understand and understand that the, the tipping point between those two states and to tailor interventions accordingly? Yes, we have. And um, I don't have all the details that certainly others in the department do. Through our client satisfaction survey, we started to introduce a wellbeing index so that we could get um, some analysis on whether um, the wellbeing framework is working. And we've been doing that for a couple of years in our client satisfaction. And it was, uh, I think we've partnered with uh, Deakin University uh, to help us in that, um, that evaluation. And do you know the name of that project? It's part of our client satisfaction um, we do annually. Okay, and it's the you. specific wellbeing index that we've applied to those questions. And 
is that are you going to um, analyse that over time to try to work out what the proper um, intervention points are? Well, AIHW have been doing some work around um, the profile of veterans and their health and wellbeing. So bringing all of that together, the answer is yes. Um, there's, yeah, earlier you mentioned DSAS as well. I'll just ask you very briefly, is it anything in it? That's the data sharing and analytics solution, is that right? That's right. And that, that is being developed, is it? We're rolling that out now, yes. Okay. And is that at an aggregated uh, level to, to inform system, uh, system response, system-wide responses, if I can put it that way, or responses across entire cohorts of um, ADF members and veterans? Or is it uh, at an individual level to enable, in effect, warning signals to be understood in respect of um, life events in the in the life of particular ADF members or veterans, so that individualised interventions might be um, the latter uh, individual the latter. Um, is my understanding, and, and so I'm not a, a great data person, but um, I like looking at it, and the data is intended to. Uh, provide to us that longitudinal data and assessment of the individual life events um, so that we can get a better understanding of what the system should be doing to respond. All right. And is that intended to enable you to um, be pardon? Is that going to provide you with information about the, the history, and including the medical history, perhaps, of defence members who have come to you for supports either while they're still in ADF or after they've transitioned out of ADF? Is that how that works? Probably not their medical history unless it's um, related specifically to the claim that we've accepted for liability. Will there be any element of that solution that in effect, could supply that powerful incentive that that will that the productivity had mm. productivity commission had in mind when it recommended a defence an annual defence levy to pick up the costs of, of compensation and rehabilitation, or will that this with this analytic solution in effect just be an opportunity for defence to learn and change its systems, but without um, an incentive of the nature of a cost consequence for it to do so not intended to uh, have a cost implication, but certainly to um, give that incentive to defence, of which they've been doing a lot of work in that at that regard, but to also show them the long-term cost. To, um, to show them the long-term cost, but not to levy it. That's correct. Um, in the hope that they'll take that on board and alter their practices accordingly. Is that That's correct. Yeah. Can I ask you, couple of questions about the Veterans Covenant and in particular uh, about the way it's uh, incorporated into the Australian Veterans Recognition Act of 2019. Is it a fair description, and I mean absolutely no disrespect particularly to, to veterans, but it is, a, is it a fair description to say that that covenant is aspirational and it is not backed up by any enforceable rights or obligations? That, that's correct. Okay. It, do you agree with that state of affairs or do you think that legislation should be strengthened so that there are enforceable rights or obligations of some description, detail to be decided, backing up the Veterans Covenant? The Covenant was intended to complement and reinforce the value of service um, from members and families. Um, so our nation is one that has a department and a system that is dedicated to veterans and families. So it wasn't intended to put in legislation those rights because they already exist. 
Um, it was more to put in legislation that this country uh, respects and honours and thanks those who serve in the Defence Force and their families and to encourage others in the community um, to, to follow uh, that commitment that the, this nation has made. Now, that's symbolic. That's not to say that symbols aren't important, but it, it sounds like it's symbolic and limited to being symbolic. Is that right? It's symbolic, but it can't be taken without considering all of the other benefits and entitlements that uh, veterans and families are eligible to. Such as under the three acts we've been Correct. discussing. You say in your statement that it was... Um, designed, this is at paragraph 171, we'd better go there, designed to fill gaps identified by veterans. I'll just find the exact words. Operator, it's uh, at page 34. Thank you. The covenant, you say, Miss Cosson, was proposed to fill the gaps identified when connecting with their local communities. It's intended to provide stronger support when veterans are faced with the sometimes difficult task of transitioning back into their local community post-service. This aim was to link the already existing suite of programs DVA has to offer under those pieces of legislation with other community programs to assist veterans to connect with their local community. So uh, what were the gaps? What were the gaps it was designed to fill? Um, a number in the ex-service community were um, attracted to the UK Covenant and also the USGI Bill um, with a, a view that this Covenant, um, we took it to the next step to have it enshrined in legislation that um, for employment and education but also um, connecting our, at the community such as the wellbeing centres and how we can bring that all together as we talked about earlier into a system-wide approach. Um, so it was always intended to just encourage others to recognise service. Okay, so in, in perhaps raising recognition and leading to better communication of the availability of services, the Covenant and the Act um, might have facilitated those, uh, those means of communication. Is that what you're saying? Are yes. they the gaps? Yes. So they were... Com com Gaps in communication of the availability of services. Is that, is that Gaps what you're in understanding in uh, the community of service. Right. I think you say there's more to be done to fully implement it, and I'll, I'll use your words. 186, full implementation of the covenant has not been achieved. What remains to be done? So the, the, at the beginning of the Covenant, one of the areas that we were particularly focused on was in our uh, provider, third-party providers, um, clinicians, um, uh, providers who provide services to veterans to uh, educate them on what it means to serve, that they might be then designated as a um, veteran-friendly practice. And um, we certainly did achieve a little bit of that with the employment commitment that's made uh, through a veterans employment program where over 500 businesses signed up to say they're veteran friendly. There is more to roll that out into the community for people who want to uh, present as veteran friendly um, and family friendly that they can display something, a symbol, um, to encourage people to... Uh, and know that they would go to a safe place. Now, you haven't done an evaluation, as you note in that paragraph, but you do say, in your opinion, 187 this is, uh, the wellbeing domains of respect and recognition, employment, social support and connection and health have all improved yes. with the introduction of the Act and the Covenant. Now, um, might not be a formal evaluation, but have you have you got trends in data to back up that opinion? Are you able to point to trends in data to back up that opinion? Through uh, the respect and recognition, the veterans uh, recognition package, so you can see trends in the numbers that um, came to the department that we wouldn't have known before, but um, that was one. Uh, but the other area that you mentioned in employment where um, 
uh, industry, the industry advisory committee have um, gone, um, had over 500, as I said, businesses sign up to say they're uh, veteran friendly. Um, and social support and connection through the wellbeing centres now that we're starting to see them pop up and we have an evaluation for that um, coming up. Okay. When's that going to be available? Uh, so we've, um, we've haven't got all the wellbeing centres online yet, so hopefully by the end of this year I think it's the aim to start that evaluation of wellbeing centres. Oh, okay. To, to, to only start it then? Yes, so that's what, correct. And how long would that take? So the wellbeing centres um, have just started. The, yep. This year is when they, uh, the original six will be online. So we'll start that evaluation towards the end of the year. And then how long will that evaluation process take? Oh, that sorry, be over I don't a year know. Or? I don't know. All right. This, this might relate to, uh, this is on a different topic. Um, it's essentially in the, in the section where you address a number of questions relating to, for want of a better word, culture, uh, the culture of the DBA. Um, and it's, it's, it's empathy, it's, it's, um, it's been veteran centric focus. Yes. And one of the, and you address these topics at a passage, paragraphs 104 to 135 of your statement. And I've given us information about some of the uh, some of the details of veteran-centric reform, particular activities. Um, sit under veteran centric reform and are intended to implement it and that that all is available to the public and it's in your statement in response to paragraph uh, questions 22 and 23 there's then a question about a veteran identifier and I wonder if this relates to that topic of uh, a better um, system-wide coherence in supporting veterans. Can you explain the veteran identifier, which I think is a, data, is, a, is a form of data sharing and you address it at paragraph 123. And perhaps that expression doesn't sound terribly friendly, but it's very benignly intended as I understand it. And what, what would the veteran identifier do and what progress has been made to have a veteran identifier? So what it, um, the thought being, um, and I know other countries have tried to do something similar where on driver's licences or um, Medicare cards or our health cards that it, if a veteran uses that presenting to an emergency department or if they are arrested or pulled over, incarcerated, they're known to be veterans and that they can be connected then to support services. So um, uh, I've spoken with... Um, some in the families in the community where a veteran has a, uh, presented to an emergency department and the hospital did not know that they were a veteran. And if they haven't I declared that, then we, we can't connect with them and reach out to them. So it is intended to support them. And we've spoken to colleagues in states and territories as well. Uh, it hasn't progressed. Um, I think that is something we would like to do in the future. Now, there'd obviously be, what, Privacy Act issues to consider, matters of that kind, quite complex territory, data sharing. Correct. Um, is the work on the, um, on the proposal for something like a veteran identifier, has it even begun or is it just an idea? Oh, it's, we've had discussion certainly in South Australia are leading the way in relation to incarceration um, for veterans um, where they're, they've, they're, they share with us um, and similarly in uh, New South Wales for employment, um, Victoria close behind New South Wales. So the, the, the state and territory officials that um, I chair and certainly through the uh, Minister's um, Veterans Wellbeing Task Force, it is uh, a topic that's often discussed but we haven't 
worked out yet how you do the formal identification uh, okay. because, as you said, with privacy and a few other technical issues. All right, thank you. And, and some of the jurisdictions, but not all, have engaged in those discussions. So They're all engaged in the discussions. Oh, they all have, I'm Yes, sorry. yes. Yep. But they don't involve different levels of maturity. Yeah, different levels. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just uh, will check my notes, but at this point, Commissioners, could I hand over to you to ask any questions you have of Miss Cousin? And if I find I have something that I do wish to ask, could I have an answer to your questions? Yeah, that sounds sensible. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr Gray. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Ms Gosling. Can I just ask on that last matter in terms of the veteran identifier, you said that you've had some discussions, all states and territories engaged, but different levels of maturity. Is there a, dare I say, a roadmap to get to an outcome on that particular issue? Uh, Commissioner, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we have a roadmap, no. Is it intended to develop one? I, I believe it would be great to have a strategy um, and um, to take that forward. I think a lot of the issues are the jurisdictional issues, perhaps, and it would uh, require a will of multiple governments to take it forward. We do have national processes to try and achieve that. So yes. Um, is it likely to go into that national process at some stage? I would like to think it will, yes. But you don't have a time frame? No, I don't. Okay. Can I ask, Mr Gray pointed out quite early on and you agreed um, that mental health um, and, and I think wellbeing is not referred to in any of the outcomes for DVA. Can I ask why? Uh, the outcomes that uh, the department has is set um, in agreement with government on uh, and our outcomes haven't been refreshed for um, several years now. I think the last time, oh, sorry, I won't try and guess, it was um, certainly before I came to the department and we are in the process now of reviewing our outcomes and to take them back to government so that they are clearly reflective of the um, the approach that we're taking with wellbeing. Okay, that, that would be good to see, I yes. think, because it certainly just gives the wrong impression at the moment, yeah. Um, can I then just ask um, the annual report, and again, Mr Gray talked about um, what's there and what's not there, and you indicated you'd like to be more transparent, more open. I'm just wanting to understand why the annual report is as it has been in recent times. Is that, are, are you constrained by a government template? in terms of how you need to report certain things or is it just the way you've done it? I think it's a little bit of both, Commissioner, um, where we have a template on what has to be reported in our annual report and we have adjusted um, whether we're reporting um, timeliness as well as recently introduced uh, the quality as well. Um, so, and satisfaction, I think, actually was when we introduced. So we, we do have some flexibility with our annual report in uh, what we, we put in it, but we do have to follow a template as well. So, but we could, can I take from that, that we could potentially look forward in the future to more detail around some of those things like timeliness um, that would be more understandable in a meaningful kind of way. Uh, I think referring there to Mr Gray's comparison year on year doesn't help anyone. Yes, we'd certainly like to do that. Okay, so <laughs> you'd like to do it, but are you, are you going to do it? Can we expect that we will see a change in the, in the next couple of years? In the next couple of years, yes. I then just wanted to ask about the forecasting model. You said you don't have a, for, a model that can forecast the um, demand. You do have a model, look at the resources required to meet demand. Um, but I'm just again wondering, given that the issue about demand is not entirely recent, you've been seeking supplementary fund, funding since 2017, so we're going on five years now why there hasn't been investment in the development of a model to better forecast. And I appreciate they're not precise necessarily, they are forecasts. Mm -hmm. um, but from, and I'm assuming here perhaps incorrectly, that there hasn't been investment in the development of a, 
a more precise forecasting model. Um, but can I, you know, why? Why not? So um, in forecasting for demand, uh, we have um, even the Australian Government Actuary is having difficulty forecasting the demand um, and what we might see into the future when they're doing their annual assessment. So we would like to be able to do that, but certainly we're, um, with the uh, new data and insights that we've developed, we can start to look back and see trends of claiming patterns. We can go back to the First World War um, and see when we could see um, veterans coming to the department to seek our, our services. So we're building up that data to hopefully be able to forecast what the demand might be. So at the moment, we are very much reliant on recent trends. which hasn't been terribly helpful in getting it right. That's correct. So we, we don't really have any assurance going forward, given that you said that even in the last 12 months, you haven't been able to accurately forecast the demand that you've seen. That's correct. Um, just in terms of the um, veteran-centric reform, you said that um, you forecast some increase in demand as a result of that, but not the level that you saw. Um, there's a couple of things in that. One is that there was clearly more out there that just wasn't coming forward, and it's good that it has come forward now in terms of people with claims um, that can be met. Um, but I'm just, I wondered why, at what level was the, the um, variation, did you get it like, was it 20% out, was it 50% out? Do you have any sense of how far out your forecasting was there in, in the veteran-centric reform? I don't have that figure, but I could um, say that not only were, did we not project the numbers, uh, some of our systems um, were a bit delayed as well, so that the processing wasn't able to keep up as we may have anticipated. Yes, we, we did hear about some of that in Brisbane. Are those systems now all in place? So, no. So we, we have inability to forecast demand um, and systems sitting back of house elsewhere in other departments that are not still not adequately resourced five plus years later, or still not adequately in place five plus years later. So the VCR was always intended to be a six-year uh, program to do that, and we're really only in year four. We took a, a year just to pause because of COVID and a few um, Services Australia is our partner, and uh, they needed to just pause a little bit on the systems. But um, the next couple of years with VCR will be really important. And just on the legislative reform, you indicated that you agree that it's an urgent matter to get on with, I'm still not clear exactly what we're doing, what, what you're doing and, and when you're doing it. And I appreciate there are decisions to be made that aren't your decisions. But for me and for people out there, is there any indication of a potential time? You know, the PC reports had a kind of indicative like, a timeline. Mm -hmm. um, can we expect to see a change? as a result of where things where things currently stand? Um, I'd love to be able to tell you when, Commissioner, but looking at what the challenges would be, include um, decisions, uh, but also funding, because it would um, have a cost associated with it, and then also the passage of legislation to affect those changes. Um, getting changes to our legislation are really difficult. And then finally, uh, Ms. Cosson, you, you answered a couple of questions, and I guess it's kind of a little bit like what you just said, I guess, but Mr. Gray was asking you about what you might want to do to fully address suicide risk monitoring and prevention. And you, said, you talked about putting up proposals in the budget process each year. Um, you talked about it some different activities and some of which have been resourced but not necessarily fully. Some have not been costed yet. Um, talked to, when you talked about lifetime wellbeing, you talked about more to be done. 
there's, there's just there's a lot to do, and I'm just wondering whether you actually have a clear program of works that you have in mind to to put up to get costed and put up to government, or uh, and I'm not I'm sorry I'm not being very clear, but there's just a sense that there is um, lots that needs to be done. Some has been done, and it's not clear to me how strong the agenda is that's not yet out in the public domain. Um, but does, does the department have a clear plan in terms of what it thinks needs to be done and getting on with costing those and putting, putting proposals up to government? Or is it that there's a sense of a bit of nihilism about we won't get it up, so when we won't bother. Certainly not the latter. Um, we are very keen to take forward a whole strategy, um, but we can't do that without our partners in defence. So um, a lot of the ideas that we do have um, are in that close partnership with defence, and this is an opportunity for us to take a strategy forward. Mm. And just my final... I'm oh, sorry, I think I said the last one was my final, but this will be my final... Um, the ASL, um, I'm sure the general member of the public out there is wondering what on earth is the purpose of an ASL? Um, I could understand, putting on my, uh, my John Citizen hat here, um, I could understand if the ASL is a number of staff to match the budget that's available to employ staff. Um, but... That's clearly not the case because you can employ a lot more staff than what the ASL allows for. In fact, at times your labour hire staff has been as high as 50% of your uh, APS staff. So if you've got the money, and I'm not being particular here to DVA, it's kind of a, a, a government question, but if the money's there and intended to be used for the purpose of employing staff, why does government impose this arbitrary ceiling of an ASL? Is there a purpose to it, if we could help people to understand what that might be? The purpose, I believe, is to limit the number of bureaucrats, bureaucracy um, across the departments to con make sure that... Um, that we can adapt if we need to, depending. Um, it's very hard to answer, Commissioner. But I think it's intended just to ensure that we don't employ too many people into the public service, particularly if the nature of your um, outcomes change or the nature of your job, uh, that it does give you extra flexibility if you've got that mix. So it's an ideology, yes. but in the case of DVA claims processing, it's an ideology that's led to significant inefficiency, distress, mental health consequences and potentially suicides. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Douglas. Thank you, Ms Cosin, for your evidence. Um, I want to take you back to the start when Mr Gray was asking you about DVA's monitoring of the risks of suicide and you gave evidence that um, for example, uh, you were monitoring young men who are recent veterans and I think um, who'd been involuntarily discharged. That's the cohort at risk. of young men who appear to be particularly at risk. Uh, uh, there's another figure which I found one of the more startling since I've been engaged on the Royal Commission, which is that female veterans uh, die by suicide at a rate of about 227% of females in normal society. Are you doing anything about that? Um, we are actually trying to understand that as well, Commissioner. When we saw um, that figure in the, the most recent report from AIHW and um, my team have done a bit of a literature, literature review to see whether other countries are experiencing something similar, which they unfortunately are, and to understand how we can best connect with those that are in the process of transitioning. It's really the risk group of those that are medically or administratively transitioning and we need to find ways to better connect with them. Um, but it, it is, it's, um, 
it's a problem that we need to address, absolutely. Has that literature review thrown up anything as an attempt at explaining why so many women in comparison are dying? Um, I, I don't have it in front of me, sorry, Commissioner. There were a few and it's just not coming to the front of my mind, but we can share that with... Um, share Council that with assisting you. or yeah. solicitors assisting. Uh, and this arises really out of my same interest. There's some evidence I've seen that Veterans Affairs in the USA has been developing data tools to try to predict um, likely places yeah. or groups of people where deaths by suicide might occur. Um, is there anything like that being done here? So I believe SafeSide might be, uh, they came before the Commission and we're in partnership with SafeSide, uh, particularly through Open Arms for the last few years, but now expanding that more broadly um, into our frontline services. So we had, um, we, are, we are doing that, yes. Is that proving productive at all yet or is it still in development? Still in development, but Open Arms, I think, are starting to see some real benefit from their partnership with SafeSide from what I, I've recently heard. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your evidence again, Ms Cousin. I just have a few, couple of really quick points. Um, in relation to ESORT, we heard evidence from some of your staff, I think, earlier this week that essentially, and I appreciate you inherited a lot of this stuff, um, the appointment of the various groups sort of seems to be lost in time, and there is, doesn't seem to be any regular or intermittent review of who should be a part of it. And that would obviously lead to a point where it may be somewhat of an echo chamber if it's an appointment for life and people are there and, and they don't have to worry about their position or justifying why they're there ahead of others. Can, can you comment on that at all? Because um, it's a very significant body, obviously, I'm sure you agree. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. So um, we do um, have a, a, I think it's every three years, we do a national consultative framework review of which we did complete one about 12 months ago and we presented that to, to Eastwood at the end of last year, which is essentially um, saying that, that we need to refresh it. And similarly, the Productivity Commission put in its report a recommendation to look at a different model um, for a ministerial advisory council. Um, so that's part of the... Um, recommendations going forward. Okay, so next steps in your view? Next steps um, to brief a returned or a new minister in a uh, um, couple months or so and uh, certainly that's part of our, our briefing pack. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry to go on again about the issue of the ASL but it is something that's exercising our mind and it certainly seems to be a problem that you know I think everyone would like to fix for you. Just for the, for the layman and I am one of them uh, and for the public that may be listening to this. So a staffing level is set by government. Um, it may or may not be visited uh, to a small extent over the many years, but is there any point when they do a zero-based reassessment to work out whether that number of people is actually fit for purpose for that government department, bearing in mind all the conditions and, and the things that are happening uh, and the demands that are being placed on that department? Is there, is there, does that ever occur? Has it ever occurred? No, Commissioner. Um, and baselining, we often talk about what is our base. Um, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, one final question. Um, in relation to the issue of the legislation and, and the amalgamation or unification of them and so on, and you are not the first one to tell us, obviously, that there would be winners and losers. But um, frankly, I'm struggling to understand for the losers, if we can use that term, those who may lose benefits, would it not be a solution to simply grandfather their entitlements and move ahead with the unification? Um, we could do that. And uh, that's certainly what happened uh, with um, Merca as well, where we grandfather. Um, so that can be done. Thank you. Perhaps we'll just see what other issues Mr Gray wants to raise before we come to you, Mr Fulton. Thank you, Commissioner. I have um, taken the benefit of that was to uh, identify five other topics I do wish to raise. I'll try to be brief. As it happens, many of them are actually connected with things that, uh, in particular, Commissioner Brown raised with Miss Cosson. Uh, can I just go to the outcomes? They are DVAs, in effect, um, mandatory outcomes against which it has to report, and they're imposed on DVA 
through budget processes, is that correct? Um, your I think it's through the budget process, um, but right. certainly they are mandated and we are, to re we are required to deliver and report against deliver those. Deliver and report. Yes. And in effect, they're the key public account accountability mechanism uh, by which DVA is accountable to the public and I suppose also to the parliament. Is that That's right? That's correct. And so they're very important um, structures mm. or mechanisms mm. in that regard. Can we go to page, or well, bottom of page three, top of page four of Ms. Cosson's statement, please, operator? And at the bottom of page three, in the introdu introduction to the outcomes, you say DBA reports to the Commonwealth Parliament on its performance in relation to three outcomes, DBA outcomes. And one of them is outcome one maintain and enhance the financial well being and self-sufficiency of eligible persons and independents through access to income support, compensation and other support services, including advice and information about entitlements. Ms Cosson, it has evidence the Royal Commission's already received that there's an issue about um, financial wellbeing and ensuring financial wellbeing, in particular connected with the election for lump sum compensation in certain circumstances. Does DBA provide free financial counselling or facilitate free financial counselling to claimants uh, seeking compensation that might be structured in different ways so they get the best possible advice on which to make that important decision? Answer is yes, but context in Merca, you um, have the opportunity to, to elect whether you take the full lump sum or you take lump sum and um, pension. And you, we do pay for financial advice for you to make that decision. Under Durka, it is only lump sum. You don't have an election. I see. And do you know, is there also financial advice available when people who have options to proceed under different avenues, if I could put it that way, in some cases I believe people might have, have to make an election between all three acts. Um, do you know whether they get financial advice about which path to choose in a way that will be most financially, uh, to, to obtain advice about what approach will be most financially beneficial and sustainable for them? If I can just offer there that they don't, um, a veteran doesn't have the option to elect under which act their, their um, a determination is made based on their, their service when uh, an injury occurred or an onset occurred um, or when they got a diagnosis will then determine which act um, so they don't get Thank you. a choice there. Thank you. Um, some may um, prefer to move on to a different act but they can't do that. I see. Yeah. Um, in any event, that, that decision where the election does exist between Durka and Merka in, in circumstances where that election exists. They don't have a choice between oh, Durka and Merka, no. Um, all right, thank you. Now, can, can I just uh, ask you about the way these are reported in the annual report? Because that was, a, that was yes. a point Commissioner Brown raised. I raised it in the abstract with you and you answered in the abstract, but since there's a little bit of time available, we'll go to the annual report and I'll just ask you to uh, explain the point about transparency that both I and Commissioner Brown asked you about. Um, if we uh, go to document DVS 0003, Triple zero one, triple zero two. That is the Department of Veterans Affairs incorporating the two related commissions uh, annual report documentation that's available through the Transparency the Australian Government Transparency Portal mm -hmm. for twenty twenty to twenty one. The structure of the report is it's a, it's available now through hyperlinks on the Transparency Portal, and you get different sections of the report. There's your review, the Secretary's review is one of the, is one of the uh, sections of the report and it explains that there's, uh, this is at 0018, there's a, a heading called performance 
and there you, in effect, give a high level report on performance and you say, DVA successfully delivered all three outcomes across our purpose and key activities. And is that a reference to the three outcomes that you've identified in paragraph 16 of your statement, which we've been discussing in part? That's correct. Yeah. And you say DVA's performance against its outcomes and programs during 2020 to 21 is reported in further detail in overview of performance. And then there's a reference to financial performance. And overview of performance is a passage in another section of the annual report called annual performance statements. Is that right? That's correct. Now, those annual we might go to that the beginning of that section. Mm -hmm. It's 0080, please, operator. And this is in performance of the statutory responsibility under section 39 of the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act. And does that pick up the need to report by reference to those outcomes? That's correct. But it doesn't stop you, does it, from providing more detailed information, say, about times taken to process claims, claims on hand and things of that kind, the, the kinds of things I asked you questions about earlier, does it? it no, but um, if I can offer that the AMO look at how we're reporting um, on our outcomes and our measures. So um, they often give us feedback on what we should be reporting. Well, the ANAO, um, I'm not allowed to go into specifics because they're parliamentary officers and so forth, but you're not saying, are you, that the ANAO would prevent you or has I'm prevented not. you from reporting more granular information about times taken to process claims, no, for example? I'm no. not saying that. No. Now, we'll just go to... Um, well, is, is it the case, can I just make a, a bit of a general statement about the performance statement section of the annual report? That actually doesn't itself include the detail as to whether the three outcomes have been met on the metrics that you report on, does it? No. No, they're in the appendices? Yes. And we go to back to the portal and click on uh, appendix um, C. Your pardon, appendix your pardon. Do you know which appendix we click on to? I'm get sorry, no, no, I don't. Um, pardon me for a minute. At any rate, you 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 go to a just, – just give me a moment. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I think I misled you with my question a minute ago. Um, you stay in the annual performance statements and there is information on certain metrics about reporting to those outcomes. So pardon me for the question. Um, so we're still in annual performance statements beginning at 0080. And there's then, if we go to um, page 0091, please, operator. Pardon me for the question. I do get a bit confused because these are downloads from hyperlinked yeah. sections and I'm sorry, of the transcript. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I I, we weren't able to find a, a, an entire oh. collection of the annual report, but using the transparency portal, if we're staying in annual performance statements, we go to page 0091, just taking outcome one, is then the one you report against outcome one. Is that right? So there will be uh, performance measures against uh, that link back into um, outcome one? Yep. APIs, yes. Now, let's just go to timeliness, because that's, that's the one we discussed in detail. Mm -hmm. And let's um, go please to, well, j just there's a preliminary question here. The outcome is enhanced wellbeing and within that, your interpretation of that outcome is that that picks up the timeliness in claims processing to access benefits. 
That's correct. Yep. And then one of the metrics for that is your timeliness in processing the claims. That's correct. And if we go to page 0094, I'll just ask about Merca and Durka, and we'll put VEA to one side. Program 1.6 at the foot of the page is described as deliver income support and compensation under Merca and Durka. Mm -hmm. And then there's timeliness uh, outcomes described as the in 1.6.1.1. Yes, I can see that. The percentage of Durka liability claims processed, brackets determined, within 100 days. And there's a percentage of those that are determined within 100 days and a comparison of that to the previous year and on that basis there's then a statement about whether that outcome or sub outcome I suppose has been met is that is that a correct that's, reading that's correct reading yeah all right and the the first column after percentage increase over previous year is 28 percent and that's that is um a big pardon i'll just take this one at a time because we don't have the column headings appearing but the timeliness uh outcome is described in the way i just read out mm -hmm. then the target is described as percentage increase over previous year so that it's posing the question have you increased your timeliness that is decreased um the, the amount by which, a big part, the incre increase the percentages of liability claims being processed within the target of 100 days by comparison to the previous year. That's correct. And provided that question can be answered yes, then on this metric you're saying your timeliness outcome has been met. That's correct, by that percentage, yes. Yeah. And in effect all of the, time, all of the timeliness metrics are structured in a similar way. They ask, have you increased the number of claims or the percentage of claims in that year which have been determined within the target period? And provided you have, no matter how bad in actual terms the performance might be, you would give yourself a yes, you'd give yourself a tick, that outcome has been met. That's great. And that's really totally inadequate for the person on the street as a measure of whether DVA is in fact um, being timely in its processing of claims, isn't it? That's correct. That's correct. It is totally inadequate. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Now, um, we can put that away. And the next point is this. I omitted to mention this. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go back for my hat, so to speak. But Commissioner Brown. Uh, reminded me of it. There's internal. There's been an internal workshop within DVA about legislative reform in December 2021, and I think when, when I was asking you questions about this, we might have mentioned that briefly, but we really focused on the interactions with the E sort. It's uh, th this topic's mentioned at the foot of page 11 of your statement, and we got to the point where we discussed the feedback in the ESORT meeting that you mentioned, mm -hmm. the May 2021 budget. And then I didn't ask you about paragraph 52 at the foot of page 11 of your statement. DVA held internal policy workshops, it says workshops plural, I'll ask you about that in a minute, commencing on 14 December 2021. Mm -hmm. A little later, and this is on the legislative harmonisation yes. piece. Yeah. A little later you say, Um, in answer to a question in the middle of page 12, when the next workshop is due to take place, you say the next intern, this is 56, the next internal policy workshop is scheduled for April or May 2022. In other words, about now. That's correct. Though a specific date has not yet been set. Has there really just been the one internal workshop within DVA on legislative re reform so far, namely the one held on 14 December 2021? 
I understand there have been several, oh. but I have not participated in them. So um, I've been advised there have been several workshops. I see. So there have been some. They started in December 21. Mm. There have been some since then. And the, and the next one is due about now. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And you, you also say, well, you refer to the budget announcement and we referred to the the updated response the government had made to the PC recommendations and it referred to broad consultation with the veteran community. Has that program of broad consultation commenced? Outside of ESORT, no. Okay. And w are there any plans for when that's going to commence and what shape it might take? You can. Do you want me to split that in two? Um, sorry, I'm just thinking that there may have been consultation with the Younger Veterans Forum, but I don't know. Um, and how the... the what we would be when well, in June this year, we've got a female veterans and families uh, policy forum, which is where we would be discussing um, legislation. So, the plan is for that broader consultation to use our existing um, consultative arrangements to talk to them about legislation. All right. Now, again, there's delay between the budget announcement and December when you have your first internal DVA workshop. Why that delay? Uh, delay usually is bringing people in. Uh, we're bringing the female veterans and families into. No, camp. sorry, that I'm referring back to the internal sorry. policy workshop that, okay. was for, that commenced on the 14th of December 21. And that's about I don't know six months or so, mm -hmm. seven months perhaps after the Productivity Commission. A big button. Uh, about six or seven months after the budget announcement of this um, consultative program including broad consultation involving the veteran community, but also the development of the legislation reform roadmap. I assume there was funding for DVA at the time of that budget announcement, was there? For, to, to, to engage in the legislative roadmap, reform program? No. Roadmap. Oh, no funding? No. Is there any additional funding for the legislative reform roadmap, roadmap process? No. Not, not even today? No, we're doing that within our own resources. I see. And is that part of the explanation for the fact that it took seven months to hold an internal workshop? It's probably the, if I may, with the definition of a workshop, there are always conversations around legislation. We're always talking about ideas. So a formal workshop is probably seen to be a delay, but um, there could have been genuinely a delay in a, a workshop, but there, I know there are discussions being had all the time. Okay. Um, just your pardon. Um, finally, I just want to tender a couple of documents that you've provided to the Royal Commission today. Uh, could we bring up DVA double zero? to triple zero two triple zero one. I understand th this to be an internal DVA management document. It'll come up in a minute, I think. It's, got an in it's entitled Weekly On-Hand Monitoring Report. This is a one-page report of the ver various numbers of claims in various categories, but it doesn't tell you time taken to process claim. No, no, it doesn't. That time taken to process claim is available in a more detailed report that's generated monthly, is it? We saw examples we've, of that. We've in changed the, the reporting slightly, sorry. So oh. um, what we're monitoring uh, in this report, you'll see are those claims that are over 300 days and bringing those numbers down. Um, but I, I'll need to um, check with the team if they're still capturing the actual time taken to process. All right. And this is the most recent available weekly on-hand monitoring report? Yes, yes it is. Uh, I tender that document, Commissioners. Okay, thank you. We accepted and allocated the next uh, consecutive number. And the next document is EXP 0004 And this is a landscape format document, sometimes referred to as a placemat. Um, and were you involved in the 
gener yes. generation of this document. You can now yes, see it on the screen. Thank you. And to the best of your knowledge and belief, are its contents true and correct? Yes, they are. I tender that document, Commissioners. Thank you. It will also be accepted and allocated the next number. Thank you. Ms. Cousin, given the document um, that Mr. Gray had up, not this one, the one before, but with the numbers there showing claims, the number of claims over 300 days, mm -hmm. can you um, tell me what process is in place to risk assess the individuals who have been waiting for over 300 days for their claims to be determined? Is there a process in place and how rigorous it is? So we did receive um, funding in budget to uh, establish a, what we're calling a van outreach. So we've got a team that are phoning those veterans that have been waiting uh, for extended periods to have their claims processed just to check if their um, circumstances have changed. And that is pretty rigorous and similarly with the uh, screening process that we had in place and they, they will escalate if they identify somebody that needs to have their claim prioritised. Do you know what they actually, you said it's a rigorous process, but are they actually making assessments about things like suicide risk as part of that? They're certainly looking at the the, um, the tool that we've provided them on, the, the risk assessment tool, to say, have you got a mental health condition? But um, I wouldn't suggest, Commissioner, that they're clinicians, that they would make that, that decision. But they'd certainly look at what we've identified as some key risk factors. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Fordham, any matters arising? No, thank you. Okay. If there's no other issues, um, can the witness be excused from her summons to appear? Yeah. Um, yes, please do release Miss Cosson from her summons for this hearing. Okay. Thank you again, Miss Cousins. And um, as you, I'm sure you appreciate, the breadth of material that we have to discuss uh, with you um, is, remains large and you'll, we'll be meeting again, I'm, I'm sure, in the future, but thank you again. Um, if there's no other matters, we'll just adjourn for a very brief time before we come back for the closing remarks. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn.
The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Mr Connor. Commissioners, before I uh, begin the closing, um, I have two bundles of documents to tender. Operator, might you display um, the hearing block three closing tender bundle? Commissioners, there's um, 26 items in this bundle of documents. I tender those documents. Uh, Ms Williams, I assume there's no issues? No, no objections or issues at all. Thank okay. you, Commissioner. Thank you. <laughs> no. My apologies. No, that's absolutely OK. You haven't heard from me very much. Once you have, then, yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you. Uh, OK, so they'll be accepted and allocated the next um, lot of consecutive numbers. Thank you. Operator, might you display hearing block four closing tender bundle? There are six items on um, this list, Commissioners. I tender those items is subject to a confidential LD claim that's under consideration. Okay, thank you. They'll be accepted on that basis and um, dealt with in, in due course. Commissioners, I shall address you briefly. I expect our closing will take about 20 minutes. Commissioners, from the Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, Ms Liz Cosson, AMCSC. I won't say anything further about Ms Cosson's evidence. Uh, might I speak shortly to the members of the public? Members of the public, the Royal Commission hears evidence in these public hearings from the Commonwealth and its departments, such as Defence and DVA. But this is not the only way that the Royal Commission interrogates the Commonwealth and its departments about what they've done and what they've not done. Members of the public, you may have seen documents tendered in this hearing block and the, in hearing block three going by the label responses to notices to give. The Royal Commission interrogates the Commonwealth and its departments by way of written questions, requiring them to answer those questions and also compelling them to produce documents. These are powerful ways of obtaining information from Defence and DVA that will continue between these public hearings. Commissioners, you've heard from a number of witnesses concerning Australian Defence Force culture. You heard from Commissioner Kate Jenkins, Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner. Commissioner Jenkins outlined some of the organisational characteristics of the Australian Defence Force, including how Defence is a command and control organisation and how Defence is an organisation that has a very strong male history. As to the impact on all organisational culture. Commissioner Jenkins said that male-dominated workplaces and industries can affect performance, productivity, innovation and risk identification and can create an increased risk of unacceptable behaviours, including sexual harassment. When asked how these issues can be addressed, Commissioner Jenkins said, you don't wait until someone is injured to fix it. You actually take steps to, pre to prevent the injury. Commissioners taking steps to preventing unacceptable behaviour before it occurs is obviously crucial. Commissioners, you also heard from Air Commodore Gunn, the former Chief of Staff of ADF Headquarters. In speaking about the, the Defence Reparation Scheme, Air Commodore Gunn proffered her opinion that serious abuse suffered by ADF members in service, including the mismanagement of the reports of abuse, can be a contributing risk factor to poor mental health suicidality, attempted suicide and deaths by suicide. It appears there is scope for Defence to do more with the opportunity it has through the Defence Reparation Scheme to learn about systemic issues relating to abuse. Commissioners, Robert Cornell AO gave evidence about his work as Deputy Chair and later as Chair of Defence Abuse Response Task Force, known as DART. Some of the systemic issues of abuse identified through DART's work include abuse of defence personnel early in their careers, abuse of women, and lots of, a lot of abuse of males in various rituals. Mr Cornell gave evidence that mismanagement of reports of abuse was one of the three stru key structural 
factors that increase the risk of abuse and harassment in the ADF. Commissioners, how defence managers reports of, of abuse is a significant issue and the Commission will continue to inquire into this issue. Commissioners, you heard from Penny Mackay, Acting Commonwealth Ombudsman. Commissioners, the Ombudsman Office has not as yet conducted any deep analysis into systemic issues arising from the reports made to the Office. Commissioners, once again, here is an opportunity to learn more and do more about systemic issues relating to abuse within defence. Commissioners, you heard from Susan Weston, Chief Executive Officer of Comcare. Commissioners, there are legal obligations under the Work Health and Safety Act 2011 that impose a primary duty on defence to ensure the health and safety of workers and require defence to notify Comcare of certain incidents. Importantly, Commissioners, the Act and the regulations do not include psychological injuries in the definition of serious injury. It appears Comcare is engaging with defence on these issues, but there is a long way yet to go. Commissioners, you heard um, more about the numbers of deaths by suicide amongst former and current defence members. Defence is telling us that from July 2000, sorry, 1970 to now, 2,038 people have been identified as, have been uh, identified as uh, suspected or confirmed deaths by suicide. That is to say, on average, nearly 40 people have died by suicide each year since July 1970. Commissioners, you heard from Rear Admiral Sharkey and David Morton about the defence healthcare system. There seems to be silos within defence. The significance of suicidality and suicide requires a whole of defence approach. Changes need to occur without delay. Commissioners, you heard evidence from a defence and DVA panel about information sharing. Commissioners, you also heard from Angeline Falk, the Australian Information Commissioner and Privacy Commissioner. Information sharing between, by and with defence and DVA is a significant issue for defence members and families. The New South Wales Legal Aid Commission will continue to explore these matters and their significance in understanding the systemic issues relating to suicidality, suicidality and suicide. Commissioners, you heard evidence from Robin Craig AO, Peter Sutherland and solicitors from the New South Wales Legal Aid Commission concerning the legislative and administrative complexity miring the regime for veterans' compensation, pensions and other benefits. A panel of witnesses from veterans advocacy groups spoke of the difficulties that veterans face when making claims for their entitlements and of the adverse effects this can have on the veterans themselves. The, significant, the significance of advocates was addressed. The New South Wales Legal Aid Commission pointed to a range of significant legal issues that might warrant reform, whilst also reflecting on the human toll that can arise from the current system. And commissioners, you heard from Douglas Humphreys, OIM. Mr Humphreys provided direct comments on some of the major causes of the troubles of the claims processing system. Commissioners, transition from defence to civilian life is a significant period in the lives of people. For some defence members, it is one of the most difficult passages in their lives. It is a period of significant risk and can give rise to long-term issues that in some cases can lead to suicidality and suicide. In this hearing, panellists from the Department of Defence and Veterans Affairs and the Commonwealth Superannuation Corporation gave evidence of the services provided, how those who might need particular support are being identified and on how services are being evaluated. There are gaps. These gaps will be explored further. Commissioners, you heard from lived experience witnesses and from witnesses representing service organisations. CB1 gave evidence about how she was sexually assaulted during her service in the Navy. CB1 also gave evidence about how she struggled to get the right help from DVA. CB, CB1 said she had five, she has had five rehabilitation consultants in a period of two years whom she found to be unsatisfactory. In particular, how they 
did not understand the DBA processes well enough. CB, CB1 spoke of how she thought this is delayed her rehabilitation. Ben Hoffman spent over 18 years in the Australian Army before he was medically discharged. He suffered multiple physical injuries during his service. During his deployment to Iraq, his mental health declined. He attributes this to toxic leadership. The toxicity he referred to was the incompetence that he observed in his, from his superiors in Iraq, including the poor tactical decisions, which in his view placed him and the troop for which he is responsible at risk of harm. As a paid compensation advocate, Mr Hoffman spoke of the need for more DVA funding to deal with the delays in claims processing. Mr Hoffman made the suggestion of transition and rehabilitation units to, as to assist defence members when they leave the ADF. Mark Schroffel, Schroffel is the Director of Australian Veteran News. He's been researching the needs of post-1991 veterans as part of the Shout Out campaign since 2018. Shout Out was created to help ex-service organisations prioritise their efforts and close the gaps on the needs of the post-1991 veterans and their families. Mr Schroffel spoke of the six key insights from this research, three being how families are bearing the hidden burdens of service life, how young veterans are losing faith in ESOs and how ADF reserve transitions have been overlooked. Commissioners, you, you heard from a number of witnesses on the topic of defence families. You heard from Ms Teresa Pine, another lived experience witness, who spoke about life as the daughter of a Vietnam veteran and the impact that her father's service and subsequent PTSD had on him, her mother, herself and her family more broadly, including her younger sister who had a disability. Mr. Pine, Ms Pine addressed you poignantly about the difficulties her strained family faced and the lack of support services available to them. And Ms Pine made detailed and compelling submissions about the impact of parental trauma upon children. Commissioners, Ms Pine's voice is, is not a lone voice. In previous hearing blocks, you've heard from parents, from partners, from children, from siblings, about the impact of their loved ones, loved ones' defence service. And their lived experience has been confirmed by and has been reflected in the comprehensive, considered and persuasive expert evidence you've received in, during this public hearing from Professor Louise Newman, Professor Sharon Lorne and Dr Elaine Waddell and also Dr Angela Maguire. Professor Newman a renowned practising psychiatrist gave evidence on the topics of child development, the neurobiology of parenting behaviours, the impact of distressed parenting and trauma on child development and the significance of intergenerational trauma. Commissioners, Professor Newman emphasised the importance of early intervention for distressed children and families and the significance of early intervention to the suicide prevention. Professor Lorne, the former Commissioner of the South Australian Mental Health Commission, and Dr Waddell, a research officer at Flinders University, are leading researchers in Australia in the field of lived experience of defence partners and families. They spoke of the barriers that exist for current and former defence members in seeking help and how families are often the ones to facilitate the help seeking. Professor Lorne and Dr Waddell gave evidence of how, firstly, parents, sorry, families are the first to notice behavioural changes that warn of a deteriorating mental health. Second, families provide ongoing encouragement to attend medical and other appointments. And third, families provide a connection with the outside world, managing the stresses of the environment. Dr Waddell spoke of the, the importance of family recognition. In Professor Lorne's words, families are the emotional barometer, keeping track of the person's emotional state and families help the person 
find a purpose in life. In Dr. Waddell's words, it's that support that keeps the individual going through their recovery journey. Professor Lorne and Dr. Waddell both agreed that if families are treated by defence or DVA as part of the defence member or veterans care team, that this in turn can improve the wellbeing of the defence member and the veteran. Dr. McGuire, a clinical psychologist and principal research fellow at the Gallipoli Medical Research Foundation, gave evidence about the disruptions that defence employment experiences can cause for family functioning. Commissioner Dr. McGuire gave evidence that defence members and their families often required multiple clinical and psychosocial agency supports. Navigating these supports is difficult and differently accessing support can lead to unmet needs and unmet needs can propagate further unmet needs. Dr. McGuire emphasised the importance of coordinated, timely and holistic intervention and she specifically emphasised the importance of accessible child care services for defence families. Commissioners, Dr Maguire noted the connection between these matters and suicide prevention. Holistic care and support may serve as a protective measure against suicide risk, suicidality. And families in distress or crisis may be more willing to disclose their circumstances to known, consistent and trusted service providers. Commissioners, it's clear that the, fam that the family system can provide emotional and practical support to defence members and veterans. We've heard that regardless of the scope and extent of the challenges defence members and veterans face, families are often central to their wellbeing, recovery and flourishing in their defence and civ civilian lives. We've heard that families often provide connection and care that serve as the protective factors against suicidality and suicide. Commissioners, the evidence has disclosed that families are often invisible to the Australian Defence Force, to the Department of Veteran Affairs and to service providers. And the evidence discloses that those families often feel marginalised. The evidence demonstrates that families that provide care without recognition and sustain quality support can be, themselves become highly distressed. This can and does detrimentally impact upon family wellbeing, mental health, physical health, financial security and parenting capacity. Without recognition and support that is matched to need, these factors can expose families to the risk of breakdown. Professor Jane Perkis, a renowned suicide prevention expert gave evidence that family breakdown is an established proximal suicide factor. It can place the defence member and the veteran at risk of suicidality and suicide. These various and often interrelated factors may adversely affect biopsychosocial developments in children, especially among young children, which in turn may lead to social disadvantage mental illness and suicidality. In future hearings, we will continue to explore the significance of families and their needs through each stage of defence life and beyond. Commissioners will continue to explore the ADF and DVA's approach to families. This month, Commissioners, is the month of the military child in the United States. We take a moment today to acknowledge all the children of defence personnel in Australia. We recognise completely the centrality of the family to defence life and the significance of family life in suicide prevention. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Mr Connor. <clears throat> As we wrap up this hearing in Canberra, we Commissioners want to thank everyone who has contributed to an insightful and informative two weeks. We're now acutely aware of the enormity of our task and welcome the announcement of a 12-month extension to the inquiry. We requested this extension to give us the opportunity to thoroughly review the complex matters before us, the breadth of which is now more apparent. It affords us adequate time to conduct more hearings and private sessions, 
to engage with stakeholders and to pursue and analyse data from defence and DVA that has, up to this point, been difficult to obtain. But we understand that for families and loved ones who are desperately seeking answers, this could be seen as yet another delay. So we need to explain. We see this inquiry as urgent. The terrible toll of suicide is always front of mind and we commissioners are determined to do all we can to improve and indeed save lives as quickly as possible. We simply identified that we needed more time. So the interim report will be handed down in August as scheduled and will include urgent recommendations for action that can now be taken. However, it's also important for everyone to note that we will not wait for the final report to take action if we see it necessary. We can and we may make recommendations at any time after the interim report is delivered if we feel it is warranted ahead of the final report in June 2024. We will leave no stone unturned in our quest to achieve real significant change. Turning to other matters, yesterday we attended the last post ceremony at the Australian War Memorial. It was a humbling and moving reminder of the sacrifices that come with military service. We also recognise that Anzac Day is coming up soon and it is a very significant day for current and former ADF members. It may also be a time when some people may struggle. If you feel you need support in the lead up to Anzac Day, please seek help. Looking ahead, our next public hearing will begin in Townsville on the 20th of June. The work of the Royal Commission will continue between hearings as we prepare the interim report, then focus on consolidating the large amount of material and data we have already gathered. All that we have heard over the past four public hearings, the 80 private sessions and the many stakeholder engagements, which will help guide us and guide the course of the inquiry and shape our recommendations. Thank you again. We wish you all a safe and restful Easter weekend and safe travels. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, I think we'll adjourn. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn.